Uh, this means a lot to me to be speaking to people who care particularly about education and reading in this state. So I'm going to tell you what I've learned about the science of reading, which is a term that's been thrown around a bit and we can talk about a little bit later. I'm not a reading teacher. I am not a researcher, not a reading researcher. I'm not the parent of a struggling reader. I'm a reporter. And over the last four years, I've had the opportunity because of the job I have really to read thousands of pages, no joke, of books, reports, and articles about how skilled reading works what kids need to learn to become skilled readers and what's going on when children struggle to learn how to read. I've also talked with hundreds of people and I have visited 10 states when we could do that to try to understand how reading is being taught in schools across the country today. And what I've learned has shocked me. And it's basically this, over the past 40 or 50 years, cognitive scientists and psychologists and neuroscientists and linguists and other researchers all over the world have conducted thousands of studies in classrooms and in labs to try to figure out how people read, what children need to learn to become good readers, and what's going on when children struggle. But this mountain of scientific evidence about reading is not, for the most part, making its way into many classrooms. Teachers and other educators are not, for the most part, being taught this science in their teacher preparation programs. They're not necessarily taught this science in professional development that they get on the job. And in fact, some of what they learn about reading and how to teach it is actually at odds with what the scientific evidence says. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about me. There you go. So um, you heard a little bit of this from Adrian, but for some more context, I've been a reporter for 25 years now actually, and I've covered all kinds of things, uh, elections, daily news, healthcare, religion, rioting. <laughs> In 2008, though, I was hired to cover education for a public radio documentary program that was called American Radio Works, and we're now called APM Reports, as you just heard. So we're the documentary and investigative reporting group at American Public Media. And in the 12 plus years that I've been reporting on education, I've been particularly interested in two things. How family income generally and poverty in particular affect educational opportunities and outcomes. And I've also been really interested in how people learn and the findings from cognitive science and how those play out uh, in classrooms or not. So almost all of the reporting that I've done has been focused on secondary and post-secondary education. That photo of me in the classroom with the little kids was the very first reporting project that I did for American public media. It was about preschool. And then I didn't do very much on earlier elementary education until I got interested in reading a few years ago. And that is when I realized that early reading instruction is truly where it's at if you are interested in educational equity, opportunity, and how people learn. So this is the first reporting project I did back in 2017, and part of it was focused right here in Maryland. Hard to Read is a podcast episode and an article about why students with dyslexia have such a hard time getting what they need in public school. And I knew very little about dyslexia. But I was hearing the same story, first from parents all over Maryland, and then from parents all over the country. And here's how the story goes. My child started school and I knew something wasn't quite right. I went to the kindergarten teacher and she told me, don't worry, read lots of books to him, everything will be fine. But reading was really hard for him. He just didn't seem to get it. So I went to the first grade teacher and she said, don't worry, all kids learn differently, he'll catch up. But he didn't seem to be making much progress. By second grade, he was starting to avoid reading. He was telling me he didn't wanna to go to school. And the teacher said, don't worry, we just haven't found your child the right book yet. It'll all come together in time. And it went on and on like this. The parents saying something's not right and the school saying everything's fine and the parent really not knew, knowing what to do because the schools are the education experts, right? Now, maybe by now the mom is thinking, could my child have dyslexia? But when she brings up dyslexia with the school, they tell her, no, no, we don't say that here. We don't use the word dyslexia. So maybe her child gets pulled out of the classroom for some extra help. Maybe he gets some accommodations eventually, extra time on tests, maybe some audiobooks. But her boy still does not learn how to read because he's not taught how to do it. Because this is what I've learned in my reporting. The school does not actually know that much about how reading works which means the school doesn't really know what's going on when a child is struggling to read and they don't at the end of the day necessarily know quite what to do about it. 
I took a class of, uh, on the science of reading. Many of my classmates were teachers and here's what some of them said about their preparation to teach reading. I didn't feel adequately prepared to teach reading. This is hard for me to admit because I have several degrees and felt like I should know what I was doing. I kept falsely reassuring myself my students weren't making growth because of this reason or that reason, although deep down I feared it was me and my instruction. I wasn't adequately prepared. It's not that I didn't care, it's that I didn't know any better. And then this teacher. I felt so angry and guilty when I was finally taught the basics of reading science. I thought, how did you let me teach literacy without knowing this? So I'm gonna explain some of the basics uh, of what I've learned about the science of reading in just a minute. But first I wanna finish the story of that worried mom with the struggling reader. So here's what happens if she has time and especially if she has money. <clears throat> she takes things into her own hands. She pays for private testing and that can cost thousands of dollars. She may pay for private tutoring that's more thousands of dollars. She might hire an educational consultant or an attorney or maybe both to help her fight for what her kid needs in public school. And all of this is not just really expensive, it's also really exhausting and frustrating and hard. And the mother begins to realize her child may never get what he needs in public school or he's not gonna get it fast enough because now he's eight or nine years old and he's starting to hate school. And he's falling behind in other subjects because he can't read well enough. Maybe he's beginning to act out in school, or maybe it's manifesting as depression and anxiety and withdrawal. And maybe her child, eight or nine years old, has actually said to herself, said to her, I want to kill myself. I have heard this from a, an alarming number of parents, little kids who say they want to die because they can't read very well. And this is when, if they have the resources, the parents pull their child out of public school. Maybe they homeschool them or maybe the family figures out a way to come up with the tens of thousands of dollars that it can cost to send the child to a specialized private school if there's a good private school nearby. And that's a big if in a lot of parts of this country. At one point I was with a group of moms in a dyslexia advocacy group here in Maryland. And I realized that none of them had their struggling readers in public school anymore. They'd all given up on the idea that public schools could help their kids learn how to read. Here's the situation that we're in in this country. If you can come up with the money to pay for it, you can probably find a way for your struggling reader to be taught how to read. But if you don't have the money and your child is not learning to read in school, what do you do? The equity implications of this are stunning. If you're from a low or even a moderate income family, there's no safety net. There's no backup if you're not being taught to read in school. As one mom put it to me, getting help for a struggling reader is a rich man's game. Reading the most basic and fundamental skill, the foundation upon which all academic learning is built. That is a rich man's game. So how did this happen and how is it allowed to continue? So this is what led me to the next reporting project, which is called Hard Words. So this is a podcast episode and an article. It's from 2018 and it's about core reading instruction. So it's not what needs to be done for struggling readers in particular, but rather what do all children, what do all people need to learn to become good readers. The bottom line from decades of scientific research is basically this. What kids with dyslexia need to learn to become good readers is not substantially different from what all people need to learn to become good readers. Kids with dyslexia need a more intense dose of a certain kind of instruction, but all kids benefit from the kind of instruction that kids with dyslexia desperately need. Now, hard words focus quite a bit on phonics instruction for two reasons. One, phonics has been the focus of so much debate and controversy for years. When people are fighting about reading, they're usually fighting about phonics. And the other reason I focused on phonics is because what scientists have discovered is that phonics skills are critical when it comes to becoming a good reader. Why is that? Because it turns out the starting point for reading is sound. What a child has to figure out to become a skilled reader is that the words that she hears and knows how to say are made up of speech sounds. Those are called phonemes. And she has to understand that in an alphabetic language like English, phonemes are represented by various letters and combinations of letters. So this is something that human beings have to be taught. Reading school does not develop naturally in response to being read to. Learning to read is not like learning to speak. 
If you immerse a child in an environment of spoken language, unless she has a hearing problem or a severe developmental issue, she will learn to talk. Not so with reading. Immersing children in a literate environment is not enough. We are not born with brains that are wired to read. And that's because human beings invented written language just a few thousand years ago, which is relatively recently in the scope of human history. So children need to be taught how their written language works. Now, some children, it turns out, need very little instruction, but some children need a lot. This is a slide that some of you have probably seen. It's made by a woman named Nancy Young, and she's compiling estimates from a number of studies. And you can find a footnote where she talks about the studies that helped her come up with these numbers. So no one knows exactly how these numbers break out, but about 40% or so of kids are going to learn to read no matter how you teach them. A little bit of instruction and immersion in a literate environment, which is important, it's probably going to do the job for those kids. But most children, more than 50% probably, are not going to learn to read well unless they're explicitly taught how their written language works. And some kids are going to need a whole lot of explicit instruction. So a key thing for educators and policymakers to understand is that all kids benefit from being taught how their written language works. Even those kids who may not need it can become better readers and better spellers if they are taught how their written language works. Now, no one is arguing that phonics instruction is all children need to become good readers. It is not. There is much more to teaching a child how to read than teaching phonics. So now we're going to get a little bit to like what the science of reading is. So to understand how kids learn to read, a really good place to begin is something called the simple view of reading. Now, the simple view of reading does not say that reading is simple. It simply divides reading into two parts. So this simple view was first proposed quite a long time ago. I was still in high school. It was 1986 by a couple of researchers named Philip Goff and William Tunmer. They proposed this model because they were trying to clarify the role of decoding in reading comprehension, because everyone, absolutely everyone agrees that the goal of reading is to comprehend text. The question is, how does a little kid get there? The simple view says that reading comprehension is the product of two things. So one is your ability to decode words. You see the letter string R-E-A-D-I-N-G and you know that that string of letters represents the word reading. Now, the other part of the equation is your language comprehension. So that's your ability to understand spoken language. We're not talking about your ability to read text. Language comprehension is your ability to understand meaning when someone is talking or when text is being read out loud to you. So for example, when someone says to you, she's reading the book, you know what the verb means in that sentence. You know what she is doing. The simple view says that you, if you have really good language comprehension skills, but zero decoding skills, your reading comprehension will be zero because zero times anything is zero. Simple view also says that if you have really good decoding skills, but very poor language comprehension skills, you just don't know the meaning of that many words in spoken language, your reading comprehension is not going to be very good either. Now, the significant thing is to look at how this applies to learning how to read. Most kids entering school have very little when it comes to the decoding part of the equation. They have zero or close to zero when it comes to the D in the simple view of reading equation. But they do have something when it comes to the language comprehension part of the equation. In other words, when children enter school, they know the meaning of lots of words, but they don't know how to decode those words yet. This is why people familiar with the science of reading call for an emphasis on phonics instruction in the early grades. Because if the goal is to get to reading comprehension and you have a bunch of five and six-year-olds before you with language comprehension skills, but virtually no decoding skills, what do you need to do to help those children get to reading comprehension? You need to help those children develop decoding skills. Now, the simple view clearly shows that focusing only on decoding would be a very big mistake. It's only half the equation. And as everyone knows, kids come into school with very different language comprehension skills. Some kids know the meaning of lots and lots and lots of words. We have very precocious five-year-olds out there. Some kids have far smaller vocabularies. 
So reading instruction that aligns with the simple view has to focus on the language comprehension part of the equation too. So that means lessons and activities that expand children's oral vocabularies. I was in a first grade classroom in Oakland, California, where reading instruction was deliberately aligned with the simple view of reading. And what I saw was explicit phonics instruction in one part of the reading instruction. And the kids were broken into small groups depending on the level of their decoding skills because kids are at very different places. And another part of the reading instruction was explicit vocabulary lessons and lots of reading out loud by the teacher. Now the words that the kids had learned throughout the school year were posted on cards all over the classroom. And this was like late winter, early spring. So they'd learned a ton of words. They were everywhere. They were starting to cover the windows and they included words like gigantic, neighborly, extraordinary, and ridiculous. Now those are not words that the vast majority of first graders are gonna be able to decode and they shouldn't be expected to. But the first graders in this class were learning the pronunciation and meaning of these words so that when they're able to read them, they'll know what the words mean. Now, by the way, every single child in this class spoke English as a second language. The simple view was proposed as a theoretical model back in 1986, and the basics of this model have been confirmed over and over and over again since. The simple view is really helpful because it disentangles some of the stuff that is most contentious in the debates about reading. In what's known as the whole language view and in the balanced literacy view more recently, the focus right from the start of reading instruction should be on getting kids to focus on the meaning of what they're reading. Whole language and balanced literacy are meaning emphasis approaches to reading instruction, as opposed to what's known as a code emphasis approach, which emphasizes decoding skills at the beginning of reading instruction. So early reading instruction that aligns with the scientific research is a code emphasis approach so that kids can get to meaning. Everyone agrees that meaning is the goal. The question is, how does a little kid get there? So this is another model for understanding how skilled reading works. It's known as Scarborough's Rope. I'm sure some of you have seen it. Hollis Scarborough is a psychologist at Haskins Labs at Yale. She's been studying reading development since the 1980s. Scarborough's Rope helps unpack what goes into each side of the equation put forth in the simple view. The upper strand is language comprehension. You can see that that's thicker and a little bit more complicated. This model shows that language comprehension is complex. It's not just all the words you know the meaning of in oral language. It's also your level of knowledge. It's the stuff you know. It's your understanding of how language works, language structure, grammar, your ability to make inferences, understand things like metaphors. So this is a more nuanced explanation of what goes into the language comprehension part of the simple view equation. And it can help teachers understand what might be going on when kids are decoding well, but they're still struggling with reading comprehension. Very often they have a language comprehension issue. Now the lower strand of Scarborough's rope is the word recognition strand. So like the simple view of reading, Scarborough's rope shows that without good word recognition skills, you are not gonna become a skilled reader. And the rope unpacks the various skills and abilities that go into word recognition. So you can see that one element is decoding. So that's basically your phonics knowledge. Do you have a good understanding of how letters and combinations of letters represent the sounds in words? Teaching students the basic letter sound combinations in the English language gives them access to successfully sounding out more than 80% of the words in English print. But children need more than just phonics knowledge to be successful with written English. I think it's more useful to think about teaching children, this is a phrase I used earlier a few times, teaching children how their written language works. English spelling is not just based on the sounds and words. English is what's known as a morphophonemic language. It means that our spelling patterns are based on both sounds and meaning. So to understand English spelling, kids should be taught some morphology. In other words, it's helpful to understand the meaningful parts of words and how English words are put together, root words, prefixes, suffixes. And children could use some etymology too. That is to understand English spelling, it helps and it's really cool to know something about the history of our language. So English has this reputation for being a wacky language full of exceptions, but it's not. It's a melting pot language that has complex spelling patterns because English has roots in all these other languages, Greek and Latin and French and more. Written English is perhaps the most 
difficult alphabetic language to learn. It takes two to three years for a typically developing reader to master the basics of written English. In contrast, it takes only a few months for kids in Italy, for example, to learn how to decode Italian because Italian spelling is almost perfectly regular. Italian is spelled the way it sounds. Now, one of the reasons I think that we have fought so much about reading instruction in the English speaking world, because we argue about it all over the English speaking world. And I think the reason is there's a lot to teaching children written English. So there's a lot to argue about in terms of how to teach it. Now back to Scarborough's rope and the elements of the word recognition strand. So there's phonological awareness, that's understanding the sounds and words. There's decoding, that's understanding how letters represent those sounds. And then there's something called sight recognition. And this I think is where things get really interesting. So when you are a skilled reader, you don't actually have to decode most of the words that you encounter. When you see a word that's familiar to you, you know the word immediately on site. You don't have to sound it out. Now scientists refer to the words that are instantly recognizable to you as sight words. The term sight words can be super confusing though because teachers and reading scientists usually mean different things when they use that term. So in schools, sight words are typically words that kids are supposed to memorize. They may be words with unusual spellings that are difficult to decode, or they may be words that kids are going to come across a lot in their reading. In other words, high frequency words. Children often come home with these words on flashcards and they're supposed to memorize them. But what the science shows is that having kids memorize lots of words is not the best path to good word recognition skills. And it turns out that weak word recognition skills are the most common and the most debilitating source of reading problems. Struggling readers may also have language comprehension issues, but when children do not get off to a good start with decoding, it can have an impact on the continued development of their language comprehension. And eventually, kids may be weak on the language comprehension side because they're weak on the word recognition side. This problem has been described as the Matthew effect. It's a biblical reference. Basically, when it comes to reading, the rich get richer. And here is how it works. If you come into school with lots of language comprehension, but you struggle with learning how to decode words, your ability to continue to develop language comprehension may be impeded because one of the best ways to increase your knowledge and your vocabulary and your reasoning and your understanding of the structure of language is through reading. In contrast, if you come into school weak on the language comprehension side, but you are taught how to decode, you have just been given the gift that is your best bet for gaining knowledge and vocabulary because you can read the words. This is why equity in education begins with good phonics instruction in the early grades. It's one of the most important things that teachers can do to try to even the playing field between kids who come from homes that give them an edge on the language comprehension side and kids who come from homes that may not be as rich and resourced when it comes to vocabulary development and access to knowledge. Good phonics instruction is where educational equity begins. It doesn't end there, but it's a foundation. Now, the good news is that most schools seem to be doing some kind of phonics instruction. Publishers and authors of curriculum materials know that if their stuff is going to have a chance of being considered research-based, there has to be some phonics. And if they didn't know that or believe it until recently, they're quickly adding a phonics component now. So that means we must be on the right path, that reading instruction is finally starting to line up with the science. Unfortunately, I don't think that's the case. Because while more and more schools are adding a 20 or 30 minute phonics block, what I also see in schools are things like this. So these are word reading strategies that you will find in schools all over the country. I've seen these strategies everywhere. They're on posters in classrooms, they're on bookmarks that get sent home with kids. You can find them all over Pinterest on teachers pay teachers. You can Google and find all kinds of versions of these little animals. I've also seen things like this. So these are all strategies for kids to use when they're reading and they come to a word they don't know. Now these strategies seem sensible enough. You get to a word you don't know, what can you do? You can look at the picture to try to figure out what the word might be. You don't want to completely guess, so you can look at the first letter, you can look at how the word begins, that will narrow your choices. You can then check to see if you were right. You can reread the sentence using the word and see if the sentence makes sense. And if you're stuck, 
you can just skip the word and move on. Hopefully you can get the gist of the sentence anyway. So what's the theory of how reading works that these strategies are based on? What's the idea about how kids learn to read words? So these strategies are rooted in a theory about reading that's come to be known as queuing or three queuing or multi queuing. The idea is that readers use three different kinds of information or cues to identify words as they're reading. This idea was originally proposed by an education professor named Ken Goodman back in 1967 at the American Educational Research Association conference in New York City. He laid out the original theory in a paper that he called reading a psycholinguistic guessing game. In the paper, Goodman rejected the idea that reading is a precise process that involves exact or detailed perception of letters or words. Instead, he argued that as people read, they make predictions about the words on the page using these three cues. So graphic cues, what do the letters tell you about what the word might be? Syntactic cues, what kind of a word could it be? A noun or a verb, for example. And then semantic cues, what word would make sense here based on the context? In his paper, Goodman concluded this. He wrote, skill in reading involves not greater precision but more accurate first guesses based on better sampling techniques, greater control over language structure, broadened experiences, and increased conceptual development. As the child develops reading skill and speed, he uses increasingly fewer graphic cues. Now, this was kind of a new twist on prevailing ideas about how reading works, and it went on to become the theoretical basis of the whole language approach to teaching reading. For the couple of centuries previous to the introduction of whole language, the debate about how reading works and how to teach it had focused on one of two basic big ideas. So one idea is that reading is a visual memory process. And the teaching method that's associated with this idea is the whole word method. The basic idea is that if you see words enough and you associate them with their meaning, you eventually store those words in your memory as visual Im images, like little pictures. This is the idea behind long lists of sight words that kids are supposed to memorize. Now, the other idea is that reading requires knowledge of the relationships between sounds and letters, and that the way to identify a word is to sound it out. That's the phonics approach. So reading instruction was basically a series of pendulum swings between whole word and phonics until this new idea came along that said, well, people don't read by sounding out words, and they don't read by memorizing words as wholes either. Instead, they use this cueing system. That is, they use context to predict what the words will be, and they use the letters to check their predictions. Now, many teachers know this cueing theory of reading as MSV. So M is for using meaning to figure out what a word is. S is for using the sentence structure or the syntax. And V is for using the visual information, the letters and the word. You will find this MSV idea in lots of curriculum materials that define themselves as balanced literacy. You can trace the roots of this MSV idea back to the work of a woman named Mari Clay. Mari Clay was a developmental psychologist in New Zealand who came up with ideas about reading that were similar to Ken Goodman's at about the same time. They didn't develop these ideas together and they didn't agree on everything, but they did meet and travel in similar literacy circles back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Clay built her ideas into a reading intervention program for struggling first graders called Reading Recovery. Reading Recovery was implemented across New Zealand in the 1980s, and it went on to become one of the most widely used reading intervention programs in the world. Clay's theories were popularized as part of core reading instruction in the United States by Irene Fountas and Gay Sue Pinnell. They are education professors who learned from Clay back in the 1980s. Fountas and Pinnell are well known for an approach to reading instruction known as guided reading and for a widely used assessment system that uses what are known as leveled books. Fountas and Pinnell also sell a reading intervention program that is very popular called Leveled Literacy Intervention or LLI. You will also find the cueing theory of reading in the units of study materials written by Lucy Calkins at Teachers College Columbia. Units of study is more commonly known as Readers and Writers Workshop. You will find some phonics in the Calkins and Fountas and Pinnell approaches. In fact, Lucy Calkins recently created a units of study for teaching phonics program. And Fountas and Pinnell have books and materials to teach phonics too. They have for a long time. But phonics is often presented as one way to know what a word is. It's one strategy. It's that third cue in the three cueing system. 
What schools need to know is that when they buy materials from Calkins and Fountas and Pinnell, they are buying an approach to teaching reading that is rooted in a particular theory about how reading works. And it's the idea that skilled readers use meaning and context to identify words as they read. So what you're likely to find in a lot of American classrooms today is 20 to 30 minutes of a phonics program and then readers workshop and guided reading where kids are taught that when they come to a word they don't know, they can sound it out and use what they've learned in their phonics lessons, but they can also use the cueing strategies. They can think about a word that makes sense. They can look at the first letter of the word or they can just take a page from Skippy the Frog and they can skip the word altogether. So what is wrong with this? I mean, why not teach kids lots of strategies to help them when they come to a word they don't know? Why not teach cueing? Well, it comes back to scientific research. What is going on in these little boys' brains as they're learning to read? And for a long time, no one knew. And that's one of the reasons we fought about how to teach reading. But as I've said, over the past half century or so, scientists in labs and classrooms all over the world have done this huge amount of research about how skilled reading works. And here's a key thing that they figured out. Skilled readers do not use cues and context to identify words as they're reading. In fact, what scientists have discovered is that this is how poor readers read. Poor readers often have a hard time with word identification too many of the words they come across are little mysteries, series of letters they don't know and they can't quite figure out. So they use a bunch of other strategies to try to understand what the words say. They memorize as many words as they can. When they come across a word they don't know, they look at the first few letters and try to think of a word that makes sense. In other words, they use context to try to come up with a word that fits. And when they can't figure out what a word is using context clues, they skip the word. And often they can get the gist of what they're reading this way. But using context, guessing and skipping words, this is not what reading is like when you're a skilled reader. What cognitive scientists have figured out is that a key difference between skilled readers and unskilled readers is that skilled readers can immediately and accurately recognize words. They don't need to guess or predict or use context. Skilled readers, it turns out, know tens of thousands of words instantly on sight. In fact, if you are a skilled reader, your brain has gotten so good at reading words that you process the word book faster than you process a picture of a book. Now, how did your brain get so good at doing that? It happens through a process called orthographic mapping. Orthographic mapping is the process that we use to store printed words in our long-term memory. The way you do that is by attending closely to how a written word is spelled and then linking that sequence of letters to the word's pronunciation and its meaning. So for a very simple example, a child knows the meaning and pronunciation of the word cat. The word cat gets orthographically mapped to her memory when she links the sounds cat to the written word C-A-T. So this requires an awareness of the speech sounds and words, that's phonemic awareness. It also requires an understanding of how those words are represent, how those sounds are represented by letters, that's phonics. So you need phonemic awareness and phonics to orthographically map words into your long-term memory. And once a word has been orthographically mapped to your memory, you know it instantly on sight. In fact, you cannot suppress your ability to read that word. You don't have to sound out the word when you see it. You know it instantly because at some point you successfully sounded it out and you linked the spelling of the word in your mind with the meaning and pronunciation of that word. Now by about second grade, a typically developing reader who has acquired good phonics skills needs just a few exposures to a word through its pronunciation, its spelling, and its meaning, and bam, the word is mapped to her memory. And the more words a reader maps to her memory this way, the more she can focus on the meaning of what she's reading. She's not using her brain power to identify words. She's using her brain power to understand what she's reading. And that's the goal for readers to comprehend what they're reading. So let me give you another quick orthographic mapping example because it's kind of complex. A few years ago when my son was in about 10th grade, in Montgomery County Schools, he was reading something out loud to me and he said epitome. So I stopped him and I asked epitome, do you mean epitome? Oh, he said, you could practically see the light bulbs going off in his head, epitome. Now my son had obviously heard that word before. Maybe he had a gist of it, basic kind of idea of what it means. He may have come across the word in print before too, paused, sounded it out, epitome, hmm, don't know that word, skip over it. But now reading aloud to me, he had had the aha, aha moment he needed to realize that's a word I think I know. 
So we briefly discussed the meaning of the word. Here it is. So the next time my son sees that word in print, he's gonna know what it is. And the science suggests that with another few exposures, that word will be permanently stored in his memory. He'll see it, he'll know it. The spelling, the pronunciation, the meaning, it'll all be there for him. What scientists have discovered is that skilled word reading is like a reflex. It is not a detective game. It's not contextual guessing. It is not a series of strategic actions. It is automatic and it's effortless. However, as you can see in the example of my son, there is much more than decoding skill at play. Readers must have good oral vocabulary. My son had heard the word epitome. The light bulbs wouldn't have gone off in his head if he hadn't. Your ability to comprehend what you read is tightly linked to your vocabulary and your knowledge. So this is one reason that reading scores tend to be associated with family income and educational background. Knowing the meaning of lots of words gives you an advantage. It gives you an edge when it comes to orthographic mapping and when it comes to understanding what you read. And having a mom who hears you read epitome and clues you into the fact that the word is epitome, well, that helps a huge amount too. Family background matters. It can tilt the scales in your favor, especially on the language comprehension side of things. But having a big oral vocabulary and lots of knowledge isn't enough. By some estimates, a third of struggling readers are from college educated families. Children need to be taught how to read the words on the page. They need to be taught how their written language works. And when teachers use the cueing system that I told you about, when they teach all those word reading strategies, they are actually impeding the orthographic mapping process. And I'm gonna explain this with a story. So these are first graders in Oakland, California and a literacy coach who worked with these girls came to see that teaching the cueing system or MSV, that meaning structure visual idea, it was actually making it harder for her students to learn how to read. The coach's name is Margaret Goldberg. She was hired by the Oakland Unified School District in 2015 to teach level literacy intervention. LLI is the reading intervention program that I mentioned that was developed by Irene Fountas and Gaysu Pinnell. LLI does include some phonics instruction. It also teaches kids that when they come to a word they don't know, they have lots of strategies for figuring out the word. They can sound it out, but they can also use pictures and context and other cues and clues to try to come up with a good guess. So Margaret Goldberg started teaching LLI and around the same time, she found a bunch of unopened material sitting on a shelf in her school. And it was a systematic phonics and phonemic awareness program that teaches kids that when they come to a word they don't know, they sound it out and it doesn't teach any cueing. And in this phonics and phonemic awareness program, beginning readers practice reading in decodable books that contain words with spelling patterns that they have been taught. So they don't have to guess at words. Now, Margaret started teaching some of her groups LLI with cueing and some of her groups she taught systematic phonics and phonemic awareness with no cueing. And she started to notice differences between the two groups of kids, not just in how well they were reading, but in the way they approached their reading. She and a colleague recorded first graders talking about what makes them good readers. So I'm gonna play this video for you. Mia is in the white shirt. She was learning phonics and no cueing. And Jabria is in the pink jacket and she was taught the cueing system. So here is the video. Yes, what makes you good readers? I learn a lot. Cause I look at the pictures and I read it. Do you remember when you were little and you didn't know how to read? Yes. Like when you started kind kindergarten? Of. Yeah. What helped you learn how to read? How did you learn? By looking, looking at, at the, the pictures. Anything else? Looking at the words and sounding them out. So Margaret Goldberg was seeing this over and over in her two groups of students. One group is taking away from their reading instruction that reading is about looking closely at words and sounding them out. And another group of children was learning that when you come to a word you don't know, you don't have to look at it carefully and try to connect the spelling with the pronunciation and the meaning. Instead, you can look away from the word. You can look at the pictures, you can look at the other words in the sentence. Basically, you search around for clues to help you identify the word. Now remember, orthographic mapping requires you to carefully look at words so your brain links the spelling with the sounds and the meaning. But cueing teaches kids to look away from the words. Here's what Margaret Goldberg said to me about the kids in her LLI groups. She said, I did lasting damage to these kids. It was so hard to ever get them to stop looking at a picture and guess what a word would be. It was so hard to ever get them to slow down and sound a word out because they had had this experience of knowing that you predict what you read before you read it. 
As Margaret was noticing the differences between her two groups of students, she was discovering the scientific research on reading. It was not stuff she knew or had been taught. And she was shocked by what she was learning and how different it was from what the curriculum materials, materials were telling her about how reading works. But what Margaret was learning from the curriculum materials about how reading works is what lots of teachers are learning about how reading works. Instructional approaches that include cueing are all over American classrooms. This podcast and article from 2019 is where I explain the problems with the cueing and strategies approach to teaching reading. As I said earlier, most schools do some kind of phonics instruction these days, but just because a school has added phonics doesn't mean that reading instruction aligns with the scientific research on reading. If children are being taught the cueing system, they are being taught to read the way that poor readers read. This, I think, is a big elephant in the room when it comes to reading instruction in the United States today. Schools and publishers are adding what I've come to think of as a phonics patch. They're checking the phonics box, but they're still teaching cueing. Why is that? Well, I think there are many reasons, but a big one is that schools are better at adding things than they are at taking things away. And many educators believe in cueing because if they were taught anything about how reading works, they were likely taught the idea that readers use meaning, structure, and visual cues to identify words as they're reading. And cueing seems to work for some kids because some kids, maybe even most kids in some schools, are going to learn to read no matter how they're taught. They will learn to read in spite of the instruction, but many kids won't. So this is a What the Words Say, which is the most recent podcast episode and article where I try to explain the consequences of all of this. Now, this podcast episode starts with a visit to a juvenile detention center where you will find an awful lot of struggling readers. The big problem that we are facing in this country is that reading instruction is based on an assumption about reading that turns out not to be true. The assumption is that as long as kids are in an environment that supports and encourages lots of reading, they will become good readers. When kids struggle to learn how to read under these conditions, there are typically two responses. One, there must be a problem in the home. The child wasn't read to enough. Or two, there must be a problem in the child. He or she has a disability. But usually it's neither of those things. Most of the time when kids can't read, it's because they were not taught how to do it. So I'm gonna leave you uh, with this slide to consider and help us tee off the panel that's coming next. So these are scores on the most recent National Assessment of Educational Progress, the NAEP. And this is why all of this matters so much. Look at the children who are having the hardest time with reading. Notice how dramatic this problem is for children of color. And please notice that white children are not doing so great either. More than half of them are reading at basic or below. This right here is why how we teach kids to read matters so much. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Ms. Handford. That was mind-blowing and gave us fertile ground for a really great conversation that we're about to have with this esteemed panel. Again, I'm Laura Johnson, NAACP of Maryland, Education Co-Chair, and also the Vice President of Communications for the National Summer Learning Association. I'd like to uh, welcome our esteemed panel to the virtual stage and would like to ask each of them to introduce themselves. They'll take two minutes to tell about their background and the work uh, with regard to reading literacy. Uh, we have first up Dr. Washington. Good morning. Um, I'm Dr. Julie Washington. I am a professor in the School of Education at the University of California, Irvine as of Monday. Um, and <laughs> I am happy to be with you this morning. My um, research focuses on the intersection of um, language literacy and um, poverty. And in particular, my, uh, I'm focused on African-American kids and how the use of cultural dialect impacts the development of reading. And um, over the years, uh, uh, I fi I'm finding recently that Emily and I are in a lot of panels together. And um, this work with this population of students is very important as the graph that Emily showed um, indicates that these are the children 
in addition to um, Native American children who are struggling the most um, with learning to read. So I'm happy to be here this morning and to talk with uh, this group about some of the variables that we find impacts um, their outcomes. Thank you for being with us. We're gonna go next to Ms. Laura Hankins. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, I am uh, so very honored to have been asked to be part of this work today. Um, my name is Laura Hankins. I'm the reading specialist at Gaithersburg Elementary in Montgomery County Public Schools. Um, I was a classroom teacher um, for a short part of my career, um, but quickly uh, got my master's in reading um, because we, for what we all know, that literacy is the most powerful thing that um, teachers can offer a child. So I wanted to study more and I wanted to do more of that work. Um, so I've been in the school system for 25 years. Most of that time has been at Gaithersburg for 20. Um, but uh, my undergrad and my master's program didn't teach me anything about the science of reading. I'm sure that's an experience a lot of us have shared. Um, so about six years ago, I went back to school um, to study dyslexia and that led me to the study of the science of reading and diving a lot more deeply into that. So, um, so I've been helping to lead my school with enormous support from my principal um, to shift from my district's balanced literacy approach to one of structured literacy at Gaithersburg. Um, I'm working with my special education team to understand dyslexia and write appropriate IEPs um, for those students and uh, working with the intervention team to um, deliver systematic, explicit and cumulative, you know, intervention instruction um, that, that they need and deserve. Um, so I'm, I'm just trying to be an advocate to spread the knowledge of science of reading uh, around my district as much as I can and to help my school um, move forward with uh, instruction that is reflective of the research. And um, we're, we're making great strides towards that. So um, it's been a really exciting journey. Um, and again, I'm so excited to be here today. Thank you very much for being here. Dr. Jade Wexler, we'll go to you next. Hi, thank you all so much for having me as well. Um, my name is Jade Wexler and I am an associate professor at the University of Maryland in the special education program um, and co-director of the Language and Literacy Research Center at the University of Maryland. Um, most importantly, I am a product of Montgomery County Public Schools and Prince George's County Public Schools. And I was a teacher in Montgomery County Public Schools um, at high school. Um, I was a high school special education English and reading teacher. And it was during um, that time when I was teaching that uh, I was teaching, you know, 10th, 11th graders who were coming to me and were still struggling um, to really read. And my department chair at the time um, let me sort of pilot uh, a, a program and some practices, if you will, that um, align with the science of reading. And I finally saw, started to see some differences, um, but I still didn't feel like I had enough. I would literally come back to um, come to class and the students would say, what did, what did you learn when I was getting my master's? And they wanted to learn. I didn't know enough, so I went back to school. I went to UT Austin and was lucky to study with Dr. Sharon Vaughn. Um, and there I was also fortunate to be a part of some of the first large scale response to intervention studies at the secondary level. We worked on a lot of reading interventions for kids with very intensive reading and behavioral needs. Um, soon enough that landed me also working on some dropout prevention intervention. And uh, that school to prison pipeline, I ended up working in the juvenile correctional facility working on reading intervention with um, those students. And so finally, my parents said, are you ever coming back to Maryland? I was fortunate to come back and have my, got my position at University of Maryland. Um, and we continued to work on the reading interventions, but we also continued to do things like observation studies where we were seeing that the research was not being translated to practice, that teachers were not getting the training that they needed and they were not implementing these practices. So all of my work now focuses on professional development and coaching. We have several large scale federally funded studies where we are trying to support um, different coaching models and developing whole school literacy models at the middle school level. So I'm really excited to be here today. Um, and very passionate about this topic. So critical, and glad you came back to Maryland. We're Thank gonna you. move on to Dr. Soleri. Emily Soleri, you're up next. 
Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm Emily Solari. I am a professor of reading education at the University of Virginia. And I also coordinate our reading education program. Um, and in this role, I've spent a lot of time in the past, I guess it's now two and a half years. I've been here for two and a half years. Also, I came from the University of California. So um, welcome to the University of California, Julie. I'm, I'm a product of the UC system. So um, I, I've spent a lot of time uh, rethinking how we are preparing our teachers in reading um, at UVA. And I think that's my role here today. My research background is that I have, I have done a lot of different randomized control trials in um, school settings, looking at how we can train teachers, um, general education teachers, to see themselves truly as interventionists for kids who are struggling to learn how to read. Um, so how do we work with gen ed teachers and K-3 to um, to provide core evidence-based instruction and also to identify and figure out who are the kids that are struggling the most in my classroom and how do I set up my instruction in a way that I can also meet the needs of those kids above and beyond the core um, evidence-based instruction I'm providing. So that has been my, also working with um, kids who are English language learners has also been another focus um, of my work. So thank you for having me. Thank you. And we just heard from uh, Ms. Emily Hanford, thank you for all the great work and for shining a spotlight on this issue. So we're going to dive right into this conversation. And I, I wanted to channel uh, a, the spirit of optimism from my dear colleague, Kareem Weaver, who you'll hear from a little later. He's with the NWCP of Oakland. And uh, he has this saying that when we focus on good science, and good sense that we can do better on the literacy front. And so we're delighted to have all of you on this, uh, on this conversation uh, on this virtual stage. Our first question goes to Dr. Julie Washington. So based on your research, what does the evidence suggest about the best approaches to teaching literacy, especially to children of color? Um, <clears throat> I, I think Emily did a great job uh, covering what constitutes uh, good literacy. And so before I talk about differences, I want to stress that um, every child needs the same thing, good teaching, access to books and opportunities to read. And that doesn't matter whether you're a child of color or not, every child needs those things. Um, but when we talk about children of color, it's interesting that we talk about um, these issues by race and ethnicity. And so we tend to put kids all in the same box um, when we talk about children of color, but a lot of it is about income and background, which is one of the things that Emily touched on. So children of color who are um, coming from backgrounds that are middle to upper middle income don't have the same issues with reading that or the same struggles with reading that we see in our kids who are, um, growing up in poverty. And unfortunately, you know, I study African American kids, many kids of color are disproportionately poor, which is why we tend to see um, so many issues uh, related to reading and associated with race and ethnicity. So it depends on who you are as a child of color, um, what you will need that is different from what all children need. Um, and so when we talk about children of color who are growing up in poverty, um, one of the things that we have learned is that the attention to language skills is very, very important. That when we talk about issues related to language, we often talk about vocabulary, which we know is important. That children who come from different backgrounds often have different word knowledge, different world knowledge, and that that impacts their ability to read words like epitome. And if it's not part of your experience, that when you when someone tells you what the word is, um, you still may not know what it is because it's not part of your experience. So that aspect of language is always something that uh, we see people discuss. But also, um, in addition, when we talk about children who are bilingual, we understand that um, children who are speaking a different language and learning to read in another language need attention to language. But I wanna shine a light on kids who have variation within English. So kids who speak different dialects of English often need the same attention. 
So these children are kids that we call bi-dialectal. So they speak more than one dialect. And so they're bringing language differences to the classroom. And the more language difference there is in your system, the more attention that you need to language when you're learning to read. And so these are our children who use a lot of dialect for whom when we listen to them speak, we hear them, their language being very different. Those children um, we know will have systematic differences in phonology. So the sound system, which is what we use to teach reading and also in sentence structure, morphology, which is word endings. And so paying close attention to how those children are mapping language onto reading is something that we find makes a really big difference. There's a real focus. Um, we talk a lot in, in research about the need to learn the language of the classroom. So the need to be able to switch from your community language to the language of school. And the way that that's been interpreted, unfortunately, I feel a little bit like Margaret Goldberg, where um, some of the ways that that, were, that that has been interpreted is that people go into the classroom and try to change the language of children explicitly, when in fact, what we find in our research is that language and reading are reciprocal. So if you teach kids to learn to read, code switching takes care of itself. And uh, that you will learn to use the language of school by being able to read the materials that are presented in school. And so these kids need good teaching. They need attention to their language skills. They need access and opportunity. It's not just about skill, it's about access to good teaching, to great reading materials, to reading materials that are relevant um, to who you are as a, a child of color and the opportunity to read those books. And I can't stress that enough um, <clears throat> because many of us have had the experience of going into schools, especially urban schools, where they have all the materials, but they're in a closet and nobody's using them. So the kids need opportunities to read and to be taught to read well. Um, and so many things that we see that are important for all kids are also important for children of color, but they also have additional needs um, that we that teachers need to attend to in the classroom. Thank you for those distinctions. And uh, this is a conversation, so any of the panelists feel free to, to weigh in at any point. Um, we're gonna go to Ms. Hankins. Um, your school is implementing the science of reading for a population of majority English language learners. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the, the practices that you have found uh, in working with English language learners to be effective? Sure. Um, yeah, Gaithersburg is a very special place um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, one being the population that we serve. Um, Gaithersburg City, uh, not many people re realize, um, might know that it's one of the most diverse cities in the country. Um, we're on all the tops of those of those lists that that rate those statistics, and um, and so our my school, Gaithersburg Elementary, we have about 850 students. We're pre-K to five. Um, uh, we are Title One school. We're about 80% farms, 80% um, Hispanic, mostly multilingual learners, mostly immigrant families. Um, we're about 15% Black, 5% White and Asian, um, and we have a very high mobility rate, um, about 25. 20 to 25% every year mobility rate. So that, that is a challenge as well. Um, so I, I mentioned I started at Gaithersburg 20 years ago. And for most of that time, like most public schools nationwide, we practiced a balanced literacy approach um, to teaching reading. It didn't work well for our students. Um, I, as the reading specialist, was supposed to be leading a building, you know, um, you know, for of proficient readers, and it wasn't happening. Um, our data reflected the national statistics that um, Ms. Hansford talked about. And, um, and knowing that literacy is such a powerful route to social justice. I mean, we were clearly failing many, many students. And so that's why I went back to school and I wanted to learn what to do. Um, and so five years ago, we started responding to the research in two ways. Um, first, we started our shift from balanced literacy to practices more aligned with the science of reading. Uh, we now can say that we are implementing a code emphasis um, curriculum um, in pre-K to two. And we are working to move that up through the upper grades while um, we have already shifted our focus away from balanced literacy practices like leveled groups and readers um, and towards using complex text um, with all students to build their knowledge and vocabulary and to explicitly teach foundational skills um, in all the grades pre-K to five. 
Um, we call ourselves at Gaithersburg a language literacy school. At the same time that we began to shift the shift towards um, research supported practices from the science of reading, um, we also responded to the research about how multilingual learner, learners learn to read. And so we started our biliteracy, bilingual biliteracy program. We call it BB. Um, my principal, Meredith McNerney, gets all the credit for this. She did all of the research and, and um, responded to it that um, so we offer our Spanish, native Spanish speaking students um, in kindergarten a 50 50 split of all instruction in Spanish and English. Um, we're the only school in Montgomery County, I believe, with that model where we serve our native Spanish speakers. We don't include our native English speakers in this program, dual language. We're not doing that. Um, but we are responding to the research that shows that, that has, um, says that. Um, children learn to read, they learn the phonology and um, orthography uh, in their native language a lot easier than they do, uh, I think that Dr. Washington mentioned, in a, in a language that is not their native language. So, um, so many of our na native Spanish speakers, um, they also have limited language in their first language. They're coming to us with what we would consider underdeveloped vocabularies in Spanish. So we are trying to build their L1 um, in Spanish as well, their, vo their vocabularies, um, and, and also teaching them the foundational skills in Spanish while introducing English um, at the same time with those same foundational skills in English. So um, we know that this, paired with systematic, explicit phonemic awareness and phonics construction and explicit intentional language development um, is what our students need to not only just be bilingual, but also biliterate. Um, we have a monolingual program in our school as well um, for our monolingual students. Um, and our BB program has expanded now to third grade. Uh, so we have it in K to three now. And more than half of our students participate in our BB program. Uh, we have some, we do have students who speak another language other than Spanish in our school, and we try to support them as much as we can with uh, multi, you know, ML, ML language support in the monolingual classrooms. For our MLs, uh, we know that bridging the two languages is really critical. We do everything we can to make use of cognates and always allow them to demonstrate understanding of content in whichever language they prefer. We study the phonology in both language, both languages and teach them the similarities and differences between those phonologies explicitly. We recognize the sounds that are unique to both languages and allow our students time to master the unique sounds of English. We know that Spanish is a more transparent language. And so when we teach them phonics in both languages, we are sympathetic and responsive to how difficult it is to do that code switching. Um, for example, we know the vowel sounds and complex consonant blends are very difficult and very different from Spanish. So we spend more time on that with our MLs. Um, we teach our primary students the morphology of English as early as we can so that comprehension and spelling become easier in time. So yeah, like I said, Gaithersburg is a really special place. We have a really special staff that's very passionate about this work. We tell our MLs that being bilingual is a superpower. Um, one, of, uh, one, of, one that many of us mono, monolingual teachers envy. Um, being biliterate is even a greater superpower, and our goal is for our, our MLs um, to leave GES after fifth grade, being the most powerful sixth graders in Montgomery County because they will be biliterate. That's our that's our passion and our push. So um, uh, that's how we're trying to serve our our population. Thank you. I, I see Dr. Washington. Did you want to chime in here? I did. I mean, um, thank you for that, Laura. And when I listened to that conversation about how we handle two languages. I wish we handled two dialects the same way. Mm -hmm. We seldom encourage kids to use their dialect to support reading. Instead, mm -hmm. when they get to school, the first thing we try to do is extinguish it. And that is problematic for our students because you are right. The phonology that you learn at home, the language that you learn at home should support you in your reading development. And we have not, because we do not typically acknowledge within language variation, we have not spent much time as researchers and as teachers learning how to help students of color who are native English speakers learn to use their language systems to, to support their reading development. Um, I've been in a couple of schools across the country where they actually have used um, bilingual uh, curricula 
to work with African-American students to teach them the language of school and the results are amazing. But it's not just because it's bilingual, it's the attention to dual language learning. And in the case of children who are learning two dialects of English, they are also dual learners of, of language and their language differences need to be accounted for in reading the same way you're describing. I would um, put forth that if we allowed that the phonology, the morphology and the syntax of um, uh, second dialects should be considered in the reading process and used to contrast in reading the way you're talking about, we might have better readers and we would be able to improve the outcomes. That's that good teaching piece. So in addition to the um, science of reading, on top of that, for our uh, dual dialect speakers, we need the same kind of intentional language approach that you're talking about for bilingual speakers. Are you seeing that anywhere in the country where they are tapping into the dual dialect and using that to support reading instruction? Do you see that happening anywhere? Not, when they do, they're not talking about it because the last time they talked about it, I don't know how many people remember Ebonics, when they tried to talk about it, that was a nightmare. And, and so it ended up being um, ridiculed and so forth. So if people are doing it, they're not talking about it. Um, and where they are doing it, I, I'm not sure, we're starting to, in our own research, make explicit connections between bilingualism and bidialectalism, so that people will see this idea of two languages as being possible within languages, as mm -hmm. well as across languages. And there are some researchers who talk about how variation within language is so much more subtle that it actually can be harder for kids, um, because it's still English, but there are these distinctions that kids need to be able to make. And I do not think that there are very many people who are doing this. Instead, what we see is people go in and trying to teach kids to code switch. So you need to use standard English, then you'll learn how to read. I would say that you do need to learn the language of the classroom, but if we would use the language that you bring to the classroom to support you in the classroom, your reading outcomes might be improved. Thank you for that. So we're going to move the conversation a little bit towards older youth and tur turn to Dr. Jane Wexler. Uh, let's talk about adolescence, such a, a critical transitional time. And given your research in the area of adolescent literacy, can you describe a little bit about secondary struggling readers and what practices support this population and how we should be thinking about implementing around supporting these learners. Yeah, um, so I think Emily Hanford did a great job explaining the Matthew effect of the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And um, it's really true. So when, you're, when you struggle with reading, you don't read. And so the gap is going to continue to widen in, in many ways. And so just you know to throw out a couple of facts, about 60% of eighth graders are scoring below proficiency levels in reading and achievement. Um, matters are worse for our students of color. Only 18% of African-American, 23% of Hispanic students are reading at proficient levels. Um, and matters are worse for students with disabilities. So when students with disabilities reach the secondary grades, they're on average about three years behind in reading. Um, many of these students, as you all know, are also disengaged, um, rightfully so, right? So they've struggled with reading for so many years. And one way that we like to talk about it is really thinking of these students as malnourished. They're malnourished in, the air, in many areas related to reading and just content knowledge in general. So um, these students don't have background knowledge about plate tectonics when we introduce this subject in science. You know, they don't have um, vocabulary knowledge that they need. These kids haven't practiced reading at all. And so they don't um, have their eyes on text frequently, which means that even if they do have a couple strategies for what they can do when they get to something that they don't know um, the meaning of or that they can't decode a word, they don't have practice doing that and applying these strategies. So a toolbox of fix up strategies. A lot of these students, they can't comprehend at the multi-paragraph level 
a lot of them can't comprehend at the paragraph level. There are many students that I'm working with who can't comprehend at the sentence level. They don't understand pronouns. They don't make inferences or connections, okay? So not to paint a terribly grim picture, and I'm sure you all are very aware of this. Um, most of these students are students with disabilities spend 60% of, or 60% of students with disabilities spend 80% of their day in the general education content area setting. Um, and, and there are a lot of other struggling readers in those classes as well. And so I, I work with a lot of schools who say, I have this flipped triangle, right? So in the typical RTI triangle where you have 80% of kids that should be okay with just a tier one. No, we have 80% of these kids who are qualifying and need supplemental intensive intervention because they are still struggling at the word level. So what is it that schools can do? And this is extremely challenging because of resources and training and lots of other issues. So in terms of what it means for instruction, the best thing that we can do for secondary kids right now is we can have all middle school and high school content area teachers infusing evidence-based vocabulary and comprehension strategies into their typical instruction. These teachers don't have to become, you know, reading teachers in the sense that they're going to be teaching phonics to these kids. They are still struggling with the multisyllabic words for sure, and we can give them some of those um, strategies that they can help their kids. But at the very least, they need to be providing background knowledge before these kids read a text, a very short amount of time. They need to be providing um, vocabulary instruction, teacher-led on important words that they're going to see in text that they're going to read. And they need to give kids strategies that they can use when they get to these words or, or something that they don't understand. And importantly, I think this doesn't have to be a new strategy a day, right? Like word of the day that we used to do on the vocabulary, you know, on the announcements, like it's in one ear and it's out the next. It's the same for these strategies. We need schools to adopt just a simple set of evidence-based strategies that they can adopt across the content areas. So if a student is lucky enough to have a supplemental reading, intensive reading intervention class, and they're taught um, something, uh, an explicit strategy for how to get the main idea, for example. When they go to social studies and are expected to get the main idea, that teacher needs to be on the same page as that um, content, as that supplemental intervention teacher as well, okay? So the generalization is really important. And then some kids are going to need that supplemental intensive reading instruction um, as well. And then just the last thing is how we do this. The, the practices need to be taught using explicit instruction, okay? so. That doesn't mean drill and kill boring, but that means I do, we do, we do again, we do again, we do again. And I'm tracking the data as I'm going along and I see as a teacher, you know what? They're not responding. I need to go back to the I do. And I need to look at those data and say, oh, what's wrong with these kids? Why aren't they getting this? I need to shift my thinking and think, what is it about why they're not getting it. And what do I need to do about my instruction? What do I need to change about my instruction to meet their needs? So I do, we do, we do, we do, we do, we do. Maybe then a you do, right? And opportunities to respond and practice is extremely important for these kids as well. So I could talk all day, but I'll stop. Thank you for that. Does anyone else want to weigh in here on that? I'll just say one thing, which is I think, um, the more that I learn about reading and the ways that it's been argued about over the years, I think that the core issue is direct instruction. And that is not something that is well liked by most people. It's just, there's sort of an allergy to true direct explicit systematic instruction in general in American education. And particularly with little kids, the idea is that it's somehow not good for them to directly teach them things. So I don't think we're going to um, solve this problem by everyone adopting the science of reading. People are really have to understand that if there's one thing that comes out of that gigantic body of evidence, it's not that there's like a specific way to teach phonics or whatever. It's that direct and explicit instruction wins all the time. <laughs> when you compare it to other approaches over and over again, over decades, it's more effective for all kids. So we need to have a bigger conversation in this country about the need for explicit instruction and exactly what it is. Because people are saying they do explicit instruction and it's not explicit instruction. I can, I can tell you one quote from a student I will never forget. 
in a juvenile correctional setting and we were doing an intervention where we were explicitly teaching them how do you get the main idea? How do you get the gist of a paragraph or a section of text? And we asked him about the instruction after we were done. And he said, I don't know. I mean, they always tell you to get the main idea, but no one ever shows you like, how do you get the main idea? And I thought that is so profound. You're so right. No one shows them. How do you actually do that? And it, the implications for teachers and teacher training for that is huge. We have to teach teachers how to teach explicitly so that these kids can learn that. Well, that's a perfect segue to the next question, which is for Dr. Solari. So you've been working to change the coursework and materials for pre-service teachers who attend the University of Virginia College of Education. Can you tell us about uh, why you've made these changes and how the state of Virginia has been a part of, uh, of this process? Sure. So I think we I think we should acknowledge that reading is broad and complex and Emily did a really good job showing us why that is. And also the education system is a very broad and complex system. And when I when I work when I think about this work, I think it's important to acknowledge that many of the daily decisions that our teachers make in their classroom are driven by outside factors, right? So it's driven by their own personal teacher preparation. It's driven by state and federal level policies and standards, the curriculum and supplies that they have access to. And so in my role on the academic side of what's been happening at UVA, um, I really thought, well, how do we sort of change the way in which their teacher preparation is happening in a way that's aligned with the science of reading? And we're a research university, just like you guys, and we are cognizant that the issues of this research to practice issues remain really in the translation of the science of reading to the implementation in school settings. And we can play a role in that. We have a role in that, um, in that we are preparing teachers to go into schools to meet the needs of the very, the heterogeneous profiles of kids that they're gonna meet, right? Many different profiles of kids. So um, essentially what I did when I arrived here, and I will, I would like to also say out loud that it's not just me, I'm the one talking about it, but there are folks that are working with me at UVA on this. And also I have broad administrative support to do this work and that's really, really important. Um, but we sort of settled around um, a few key things that we were going to stick to. Um, we were, were committed to ensuring that all of our elementary education and special education teachers leave our program with the same knowledge about read instruction and that it's aligned with the current evidence base for assessment and instruction. Um, and, and we recognize also that this is science, right? And so science is ever evolving. So we wanna prepare teachers that um, understand that they all, it's actually their responsibility when they move into the classroom to keep up with the science. Um, so we're, su we're support our reading specialists and our teachers because we have both programs here at UVA um, and that in a way that's aligned with the scientific evidence space of reading instruction and also that adopts a structured and explicit approach. What Emily was just talking about what is direct instruction, what is explicit instruction, what is structured literacy. Um, we also prepare them to recognize how access to services and equity issues play a really critical role in reading achievement. And we really want them to understand that they can be advocates as teachers for kids. If they have kids in their classroom that are struggling to learn how to read, it is their responsibility to address that and go to the people around you, the reading specialists or whomever, and, and get some help and support with that. Um, and how to, and the other thing is really understanding the science of reading, but not just understanding the science of reading, understanding how that can impact your instructional practice in your classroom, right? So it's one thing to understand the evidence base. It's another thing to be able to implement that in your own classroom. Those are two different things. And so for this work, um, I, you know, the work within the University of Virginia has not been I do a lot of work for the Virginia Department of Education, but the work within UVA to change our teacher preparation um, courses around reading methods and our reading specialists has really been an internal, um, internal work that we've been doing. And it started with just taking a really critical look 
at um, syllabi, honestly. I mean, I came in new and I just requested, okay, give me everything we've been doing. And I went through and um, we slowly started to make changes. And I think the other thing is I've learned, I'm a very impatient person. I want things to change tomorrow. And I want things to change for every kid tomorrow. <laughs> and I've learned that if you want sustained change, it actually has to happen slowly and you have to get by in. Um, and the other thing that we've sort of stuck to is that we, um, or at least I, I have said this multiple times to the folks that I work with is that we're not going to apologize for doing what's right for teachers and kids in Virginia. Um, and we know that um, sticking with the evidence base is, is what we should be doing. No apologies. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, we're gonna just invite folks to submit their questions. We're gonna continue the conversation, but just wanted to uh, open the floor for questions. You can put them in the chat. Um, but I wanted to turn quickly to Ms. Hanford. Um, your reporting has high highlighted many of these um, best practices that we're talking about and the notion that they work for all children. Yet we know that some faculty administrators and teachers believe that one approach to literacy instruction does not work for all students because as we've heard, children learn differently. Um, what is your response to the sentiment and what other criticisms have you encountered along your reporting journey? Yeah, it's a complicated one. Um, I mean, all children are different. We're all different, right? But I think the big takeaway from the research on reading is that our brains in terms of how we learn how to read are much more similar than different, right? So that there's a there's a breadth of, there, there certainly are differences, um, but it's not like we, we've, we've sort of given the message unfairly to teachers because it doesn't line up with the science and it makes for an impossible job that you have to teach every child differently. You have to like uh, figure out exactly every child and then come up with some separate, uh, it's almost like an individualized education plan for every child. I mean, it, it's so, that's sort of the message that if you were really a great teacher, that's what you would do. You would differentiate the instruction for every single child. That's impossible. We tell teachers to do that. And at the same time, we also tell them that they're basically in charge in many cases and coming up with their own curriculum and putting it all together. They're supposed to be like curriculum writers and doing all the assessment and then teaching every child differently. How can you do all that? And that's not necessary. That's not what needs to be done. It's not turning into good instruction for too many children. But I think another, this isn't exactly your, so I mean, I think the problem that we're facing today Emily said it's very important for teachers to go out there and to keep up with the science because the science changes. We're going to learn more and better things about all of this, right? But it's also really important for teachers to recognize that there's a big body of evidence that researchers all over the world have settled on. There are some basic questions that are pretty settled. And the shocking thing is that the way we teach kids to read is at odds with some of that. That is not going to change. The fact that teaching kids these cueing strategies is not a good idea, new science isn't gonna show, oops, no, go ahead, you can go back to cueing, or oops, show and phonics isn't a good idea. No, new research is gonna show us things about how to teach phonics more effectively, how to understand the subtle differences between kids, how to do the differentiation that's needed for groups of kids, for sure. Um, and I think one of the big things about all of this is that we, Scientists know a whole lot about how we read and what's going on when kids struggle. A lot of things are basically settled with many, many more questions to pursue, but the, the sort of translation of this into practice is not as settled. It's just not. So we, there's a science of reading, but the translational science of this into practice is not as well known and it may never be. It's much more complex. Um, and, you know, education is really, really complicated, but it's just, it's important to recognize that it's not like there's one program or one way and we could tell everyone to do that and everything would be great. It, it doesn't work that way. It, it's, it's, it's much more complex and there's no perfect program and there never will be. Yeah. We do have a question from the audience and it's kind of a, an obvious question that's the elephant in the room kind of. Um, we have been dealing with COVID for the, since March, and there's great concern about learning loss and especially children of color falling, uh, fall, falling behind and all children struggling with um, new instruction or unfinished learning, however we shape, <laughs> shape it. Um, 
what is your thinking about uh, literacy and where we are with COVID-19 and learning loss and how, um, how we should be thinking about literacy within this context? Anyone can, can jump in here. I'll respond. Um, uh, this has been a year like no other. We are all experiencing this um, crazy time of online learning, um, and especially, you know, with little children. Um, we have our kindergartners experiencing their kindergarten year online. Um, and, you know, it's different, obviously going to be really impactful. Um, I recently re actually wrote it down um, to mention, I re recently read a article by um, written by a, a superintendent from a school district in upstate New York. And she said, um, I sincerely plead with my colleagues to surrender the artificial constructs that measure achievement and greet the children where they are, not where we think they should be um, in, re in relation to this, into the crisis and when we go back to buildings. Um, there's lots of talk of learning loss, um, but I think we need to move our not to ever lower our expectations, but to recognize what this, the trauma these children have gone through um, during this crisis. And we all know it's impacted our children uh, in poverty so much more. Um, and uh, it's, it's another enormous equity issue. Um, I know at Gaithersburg, we absolutely recognize that and we are trying to study as much as we can to how to respond when we do get back in the building um, to not necessarily make up for lost time, but let's meet the children where they are, give them the instruction that they deserve, um, do explicit direct instruction, the right kind of instruction so that they can make the gains that they need to make. Um, but I know it's on all of our minds um, and it's going to be, it's going to be a long journey when we get back. Yes. Dr. Washington, you were leaning in. Did you want to respond? Yeah, I, I missed part of what you said. I went in and out, but um, you know, I think some of what we are facing with COVID-19 um, and teaching is um, to the question that you asked, Emily, that there are some things that are the same for every child that every child needs to know. And during this time, perhaps that's where our focus should be, those things that we know that every child needs to know. One of the things that I've heard during this time that is disturbing to me is things like, will my assessment be, you know, I'm trying to assess, um, will it be um, valid? Um, all my kids got a D or an F, um, fidelity of implementation. Why are we even talking about those things right now? That fidelity of implementation in somebody's house is a ridiculous idea. Um, <laughs> The reality is that this is not homeschooling. This is schools going into people's houses because you don't have a choice. That's not the same thing as homeschooling. And so this idea that we can keep doing what we're doing and not being nimble enough to change and try to think about what is, it re what is really, really important for us to be focusing on right now? What do we make, what do we need to make sure that when kids do show up and some of them do and some of them don't, what do we need to make sure that they're taking away from this learning context every time they come? And that's not what we're doing. We're trying to recreate the classroom at people's houses. And that just isn't working for most of our kids. For the kids who have the most privilege, yes, I, I've seen, you know, you see this evidence in the news of uh, parents setting up classrooms at home and all of those things and making sure that kids have this complete setup. I promise you that's not happening for our most vulnerable kids. Instead, they still have to um, have class at the kitchen table like they always did. And so we need to be thinking about being more nimble than we are. We're trying to just do what we always did in a context that's nothing like it was, you know, a year ago. And so uh, that's disturbing to me. And um, I was talking to one of my doctoral students whose sister goes to a high school in Miami. And one of the things that they do every day is first of all, they have to show up in their uniform. Mm -hmm. And then they have to stand up and show that they have their uniform on from head to toe before they can learn. What the hell does that have to do with learning? Nothing at all, excuse my language, but that has nothing at all to do with learning. 
And so why are we focused on those things that don't really matter? And some of it is that the really foundational things that kids really need to know in order to be good readers, we know what they are and we need to be focused on those things. Instead, we're focused on what's not happening instead of what can happen. Mm -hmm. And you know, in the beginning, there was a lot of focus on technology, but one of the things we learned quickly was that when you gave all the kids technology, that really wasn't the problem. It was just the thing that people need, that kids needed for us to get access to them. Mm -hmm. But once we gave them that technology, then we got, check that off the list. Now we're on to what the real issues probably are. It's about teaching. It's about learning. It's about teaching kids, Laura, where they are. Mm -hmm. As you said, looking at where they are and thinking about where they need to be. And that's not something we've been very flexible about this year. And um, I can go on and on, but I won't. Well, thank you for that. I, I think nimbleness is the, the takeaway and that will be with us for a while because we may be in this state of having to be flexible and nimble for a very long time. Yeah, we all were so happy 2020 was over. Welcome to 2021. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just wanna keep an eye on the time and we do have some audience questions and I'm gonna read directly. Um, I wanna shift back to higher education uh, there's a question about um, when person says our school system began revamping our programming and approach across multi-tiered systems of support several years ago. Um, but the greatest challenge has been the struggle to have the Institute of Higher Education's uh, on board with the shift in teacher education and training programs. And so how do we basically partner to ensure um, that we're preparing our teachers using the science of reading uh, and that is one of the roots to this equity-based challenge. So that's a question being tossed out to the group. Anyone can respond. I'm, I'm happy to respond to this first and I would love to hear other folks' thoughts on this. Um, but you know, I think I work in higher ed, I have for a while now, and I think higher ed is notoriously slow at change and, and often resistant to change. Um, and so I think, you know, it takes, but there are people, I say every time I talk publicly, I say this, there are people in institutes of higher education that want to collaborate with you, that want to work with you, that are committed to making sure that the teacher, teachers are leaving, knowing the current evidence base in reading. And so I think it takes some effort to find those people. I know a lot of my work here at UVA since I arrived has really building bridges back, building bridges with the Virginia Department of Education and also uh, different divisions and districts around what are the needs in the schools um, and how can we partner together. But I think that goes both ways. I think you can start to sort of search for those folks um, and collaborate them. But I, I hear the issue, I acknowledge the issue and it, it is a big part of why, um, you know, that I always talk about the different levers that have to be pushed in order to see different changes in reading outcomes and nothing is a silver bullet. Getting the, the curriculum, the best curriculum, what, you know, whatever that is, isn't going to change reading. All the levers have to be pushed at the same time. And one of them is teacher preparation. Um, so I think you have to find the people that will work with you, but they are out there. And Dr. Slory, um, there's a question asking if uh, University of Virginia, will share uh, their revised SOR aligned, um, SOR aligned curriculum? Sure, I mean, we've done that in, in the past. I think we can do it again. Uh, folks are welcome to email me. Yeah. Great, thank you. Another question, how can we address orthographic mapping in older students more explicitly? Uh, what should parents ask for and what resources are available? And this is probably for Dr. Wexler. Give me the hard, the hard questions here. I mean, I think if a student at the older level, you know, needs more decoding instruction, whether it's at the single syllable or multisyllabic word, word level, we essentially do it in the same ways that we do it at the younger grades. Um, you know, and I think an important thing with word study instruction that we found is that, you know, it's hard. We don't promote certain programs, but we can promote and talk about elements of certain programs that 
align with the science of reading, right? And so one thing is having a good systematic scope and sequence that's going to help these kids um, learn the decoding, the aspects of the, of the reading that they are lacking and then give them constant repetition in that. So, you know, you can reach out to me and I can point you in the direction of some specific resources. Um, but in essence, we teach decoding in the same way. Um, uh, you know, I think Emily Hanford again laid it out with teaching, you know, parts of words. So you need to also think about at the secondary level, how much time do you have to teach these kids? Um, are they 11th graders still struggling at that level? You know, what is it that we need to give them knowledge of right now? A couple word parts so that they can put some multisyllabic words together really quickly, or do we have a lot longer to go way back to the basics and then kind of move forward? So it's a very, very complex issue. And I'm happy to follow up with anybody about that. And, you know, we've had a lot of conversation about the research and I just wanted to go back to that. Um, there's a question from Rachel Donnelly. That, uh, that speaks to if the research isn't making it into schools for various reasons and peer-reviewed literature isn't causing people to change curriculum, uh, is there the sense that maybe results from districts will? So um, what, what districts can you point to that uh, are good models of, of this and where can we direct those uh, who choose curriculum to, to look at these, these types of models. You know, I, I'll, I'll weigh in here, I guess, because I, um, I, I, one of the, so there's a story that happens over and over again which is uh, like, I think Laura's an example, right? There'll be an individual school in a district where there'll be some people, there'll be a reason why someone really makes a change or there'll be a whole school district where there'll be some reason. Uh, there's a, a new a curriculum director who gets it or a teacher who really pushes or a group of parents who file a lawsuit and, and leads to change, right? And some of these, so changes will get made often, but then it doesn't stick necessarily because even what you're doing at your school is amazing, Laura, and maybe it's infiltrated enough, but if you leave and a few other people leave, who knows what will go on at that school a few years from now, right? So there's this story, and I know someone said that they work with Sharon Vaughn. Jade, you said that you worked with Sharon Vaughn. I mean, so like so many of these at these schools that were involved in these NICHD studies, some of the schools that were really seeing some, some great results with reading first, you go to a lot of these places and it fell apart. You know, once something goes away, a grant goes away, a person goes away, a new person comes in, a new superintendent comes in with a new idea. Um, so we really need to get like stability around this and stop this kind of like churn that takes place. And that's obviously really complicated because this has to do with like teacher turnover and administrative turnover and policy priorities and how they, you know, whiplash people around and I don't know. I don't know. There, it's complex and I don't know what the solution is, but I, I, I guess one of the things that's really motivated me in my reporting is I think at the bottom of all of this, it's trying to help parents and teachers and school board members and administrators and the general public understand something about reading and how it works and how much is known about it. And th to actually fix that in terms of the curriculum and something we haven't really talked about but one of the reasons this curriculum, one of the reasons this stuff doesn't stick is because the amount of stuff that kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth grade teachers need to learn about the structure of the English language that they do not know because they were not taught it is huge. English is so complex. So that is one, I believe that is one of the major reasons this stuff doesn't work because the teachers themselves just don't get enough of that knowledge. And when they, and they, 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 they revert to past practices, they revert to things that are easier, frankly. Teaching kids those cueing strategies is a lot easier than teaching them to really understand the structure of the English language. And it, it's and, and it, it is not the teacher's fault, but they haven't been taught what they need to know to teach reading well to little kids. And a lot of people who went in to first grade teaching didn't think that's what they were in for. They didn't think that they needed to understand something about the cognitive science. And they didn't think they had to understand the complexity of written English, but they do. So we need to work on those the, old, the teachers at the older levels as well. Exactly. 
they didn't think that they needed that either. And that's something that we need to focus on training the, those teachers on and then putting aside um, time and support from administrators, literacy coaches, and more for in-service teachers to provide ongoing professional development and training. It can't just be that one time sit and get you know, PD in August and then never go in and do modeling or feedback or anything else. And it's, it's very challenging right now for schools. I'm doing a lot of the co you know, coaching work and we're having trouble finding middle schools that who have instructional leaders who are doing instructional coaching and who aren't pulled away to do it totally understandably. But you know, I think we really need to think about what our priorities are, not having a million initiatives at once. We will get initiative fatigue. We need to purposely select you know, have some reading things that we're going to work on in a very strategic way. And over time, what's this going to look like in terms of easing it in? And how are we going to truly support it over time so that we can have sustainability of all of these practices? We're doing a lot of work on sustainability right now. And it's truly a struggle for all the reasons that, you know, we've been talking about. Thank you for that. We have one burning question and we're going to wrap up in about five minutes. I, I just wanted to talk about um, the question that just came in and hopefully I can paraphrase this correctly. What, what does the research say about the role of the developmental science and the whole child approach and effectively closing opportunity, the opportunity gap? And do you see the connections between the developmentally uh, domains uh, such as the interplay of social emotional development and language literacy acquisition. That's a really big question. Um, <laughs> I'll take a stab at part of it, though. I know a lot of uh, what I hear from you know from folks is that you know, and of course we're at, I'm at the um, you know the early childhood level. Um, supporting and developing the whole child is enormously important. Um, our school day is too short, uh, but but for sure, that is definitely a focus, um, I will say, at my school, is that we put the child's um, emotional well-being and, you know, and developmental appropriate instruction first. Um, one of the criticism I'm sure most of us have heard is that phonics is boring um, and, that, and that that's not developmentally, you know, that's not as engaging as, you know, a beautiful, you know, a beautiful, colorful book you can guess around. Um, but the but the fact is that it's not um, it's not boring for them because they're learning um, and it is very engaging for young students to be involved in in um, explicit instruction of those foundational skills. So it seems boring when you're going over vowel sounds for ten minutes um, to an adult perhaps, but for a child they're very engaged because they they want to get this and they want to understand it. So I do think there's some misunderstanding about the engagement issue and developmentally appropriate and you know direct instruction on something that is so um, you know seemingly not as um, as uh, exciting as uh, perhaps what we saw in the whole language approach with, you know, lots of beautiful books and blah, blah, blah. but it really is, we, our kids are very engaged in their foundational skills instruction because they want to learn it. Um, and, uh, and it's, and they're making progress. So that always feels good too. Right. So um, I just think that's a misunderstanding. Yeah. Can I just say one thing about this? This is sort of, this is a very big question and this is maybe a big idea. I'm going to try to express here quickly at the end. But one of the things that's really, so this question of sort of what is interesting to little kids and, what, and what's interesting to adults, I, I, at the risk of being reductionist, I think that the sort of balanced literacy approach is very appealing to adults. And it, the, it, but it rests on a foundation that the way that kids, the, the way that a person learns expertise in something is to mimic what experts do rather than to go through a series of steps to become an expert. So balanced literacy sort of makes sense from an adult perspective. But if you start to understand something about how kids learn to read and then look at some of what goes on in a typical balanced literacy classroom, we are confusing children. Children are not able to, many children are not able to put all those pieces together on their own. Some children are, but many children aren't. So it really is this question of how do you become expert at something? And there's this, idea that it's not developmentally appropriate somehow to teach little kids how to read, but it's really the opposite. It's developmentally inappropriate to expect that you will have, that if children mimic 
the procedures, behaviors, activities of expert reading, that they will become experts. That's not how expertise develops in any domain. And we really have to, this, this idea that this teaching kids how to read is sort of against the needs of the whole child, it just doesn't make any sense. It falls apart when you start to understand all of this. And again, when little kids learn how to read, it's so exciting. It's so exciting to be able to read the cat sat on the mat. It really is. I remember it as a child. I've seen it in classrooms as a reporter. I've seen it as a parent. Everyone has seen it. We need to help unlock this for kids because it's the most exciting thing that happens at the beginning of school when you start to be able to learn how to read. It's amazing. And I think it is amazing. And we are out of time, but we want you to take your magic wand out for one second. And in 20 seconds or less, if you could wave your magic wand, what are the top changes you'd like to see with regard to student literacy success? And uh, Dr. Washington, we'll start with you. Your magic wand. Of course you will start with me. Um, <laughs> I think if I could wave a magic wand, I would um, ask schools to um, respect children and families and what um, kids are bringing to school and bringing to the reading process and accept that that can be a strength and not a weakness. Um, I recently talked to a teacher who wants to be a doctoral student and I'm interested in her because when she talked to me about her students who are homeless and teaching them to read, what she said to me was, oh my God, the kids are making so much progress. I was talking to this mother today, she was in her car and she handed her cell phone to her son and we read and we did so much work and oh my God, he's doing so well. This is why I will accept her as a doctoral student because she sees where these kids are, where they need to be, and she's not judging the families for the hardship that they're bringing to the reading process. And so if I could wave my magic wand, we would um, respect families and kids where they are, take them from where they are to where they need to be without expecting them to conform to what the school's expectations are when that's too difficult. Thank you, thank you. Ms. Hankins, your magic wand? Uh, my magic wand. Um, I think the most impactful move our country could make, uh, uh, to Ms. Hansford, Hanford's point, is, um, is teacher, teacher development. I mean, we are trying to do it, like, like I mentioned, in-house. Um, uh, we're training all of our staff on, the, on being linguistic experts, which truly is what a primary teacher needs to be. Um, we, they need to understand the, you know, the deep orthography and phonology and morphology of our language in order to teach it well. No program can do that. I think the most powerful part um, of making change with this is teacher development. Um, so that needs to happen. Um, I love hearing about Dr. Solari's work because that, that needs to happen in every university. I don't know what the program is at UVA, but you know, 15 credit hours of reading science. I think there can't be enough so that teachers come out ready to teach with the knowledge that they need because there is no curriculum that is strong enough to do it on its own. Um, it's the teachers, teacher knowledge is, is, that would be my magic wand across the board, practicing teachers and upcoming teachers. Dr. Solari, magic wand, 10 seconds. I'm gonna resist this question because I'm gonna say there is no silver bullet or magic wand here. Um, I think, you know, I've said this before, we have to push on multiple levers at the same time and, they, and it has to happen it has to happen all at the same time in order to change reading. That includes policy, higher ed, curriculum, um, in-service teacher professional development. That's not just this one-shot deal that Jade was talking about earlier. Um, so I think we really have to think broadly about how we push on these levers all at the same time. Thank you. Dr. Wexler. And I totally agree. A comprehensive system where you know we're training teachers, we're partnering to bridge the research to practice gap because again, it works both ways. And I think when it really comes down to it, just an understanding that when you know kids wanna learn, they wanna learn. And some of the best ways to get at engagement and you know behavior management and everything else is 
good instruction. And that's what it comes down to. So whatever we can do to get that is the magic wand. Ms. Hanford, you have the final word and the final magic wand. <laughs> Well, I will also say, I don't think I'll agree with Emily. I don't think there's a magic wand. I'll agree with Laura. I think teacher development is the most important thing. I mean, I basically agree with what everyone has said. If there's one thing I think that if we could get more knowledge to teachers and parents and to ed educators and the general public, school boards to understand some of this stuff, some of the basics of how we learn to read and how, what that means about how it needs to be taught. I think that is so critical because wrong ideas, misguided ways of doing it flourish in an environment where people don't know something else. And part of the problem with the science of reading is that some of the stuff is kind of counterintuitive. There are things that it seems like would be good for kids that seem to make sense. But we understand something about what scientists have actually discovered about like what goes on in our brain and stuff, we realize, oh, that seemed intuitive, but it's not. And the most powerful thing is that when teachers do start to learn about this, so many light bulbs go off. They go, oh, right, just a little bit of knowledge. You're like, oh, that makes sense. Why didn't anyone teach me that before? Why not? And there are teachers all over the country who are sitting there and saying, why didn't anyone teach this to me? It's unfair to the teachers and it's so unfair to the kids. Well, this has been a rich conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your passion. And I see lots of light bulbs going off across the country. I, I think um, there's a lot of possibility here. And thank you for all that you bring to this conversation. I think I'm turning it back over to DJ or Jennifer. And I think I, we're heading into a break. So thank you all. So I will let, uh, and I think we're, um, transitioning, so hopefully we'll get the cameras. So uh, as we transition, and, and I'm just gonna uh, just say two things, which is uh, both of those last two points are um, critical. One is that the point of this summit today was precisely for this issue, was the idea that we have to push on all levers, which is why I invited all of these levels here, right? I, the um, we can't do this unless we're all on board. And and, and the whole point, and, and this should reverberate over and over and over again today, which is we can't keep going it alone, right? Independently, you know, we can take the political context and divided we fail, right? Is that independently, individually, we're all flailing. We don't, you know, different places don't know what they don't know. And, and but together, we know there's lots of, and so one of the points here today is to start this process of having a, a statewide, you know, approach that we all lift each other up. That that there's that there's a sustained, systematic process that we bring everyone together and we bring the 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 whole state with us, and and that all of our children across the state can all achieve. And I think that's that's the the whole goal of of why you know we gathered everyone here today. Um, the second point I wanted to make was actually about this issue of uh, of skills and and what you've heard. And and as a reading scientist, uh, I'm also a coach of uh, you know girls softball, ten year old girls softball. And one of the things is I never send these girls who've never played out. I never say, "Hey, go play like the pros," right? Watch what they do and do what they do, right? No, I sit there and I work on each and every skill, how to hold the ball. Let's start with how to hold the ball. How do you hold your hand? How do you, right? This is decades old knowledge that we have of coaching, you know, of, of how to coach a sport. And so it's the same approach. It's like, well, it's good for sports, but it's, you know, reading is a skill, right? And this is what I've spent the past 25 years in, you know, of my life investigating. Reading is a skill, right? And so as a skill, right? You have to build those those components. You have to build those abilities. And so, anyway, I you know, um, I don't take my liberty to say that point, but uh, we will uh, let Jennifer uh, help us transition to the next part of our day. Great, thank you. Well, I'm in awe by the day so far. I just I'm getting texts and emails and everyone. Um, so grateful to that panel and to Emily Hanford for her amazing talk. Um, we are running behind, but we just couldn't stop this conversation. It was just too wonderful. Thank you all very much for this invita invitation today. Uh, the School of Public Policy is pleased to be one of the hosts of this fearless conversation. This is one of the first times groups from across disciplines and sectors have come together 
to directly discuss the literacy gap in Maryland. Today, we have education leaders, faculty, policy leaders, and advocacy organizations like the NAACP committing to work together on what we believe is one of the most important issues of our time. In our school, we define public policy broadly. We tell students that public policy at its core is how we come together and create change. Our faculty and students come ready to be change makers. They care about issues related to the criminal justice system, access to housing, work and opportunity, as well as overall issues of equity and inclusion. Literacy is at the root of all these issues. Literacy opens doors to academic achievement, economic freedom, and career and income prospects. Illiteracy closes those doors. Research has estimated that illiteracy rates in prisons are as high as 75% of the prison population. 85% of juvenile offenders have problems reading and three out of four people on welfare can't read. The pipeline to prison starts when a child fails to achieve adequate reading skills. In short, literacy is the civil rights issue of the 21st century. At home, the numbers are devastating. Only 35 percent of fourth graders in Maryland scored at or above proficient in reading in 2019. When broken out by race and income, the picture is even more grim. COVID is only going to exacerbate this issue as we know the learning loss happening in our community is significant and falling on different parts of our citizenry more heavily. Many states have used policy tools to solve this problem. States in different parts of the country like Colorado, Mississippi, and Massachusetts are looking at how reading is being taught and incorporating their findings into legislation and policy. In Maryland, we recently passed the Ready to Read Act with the support of our faculty member, Eric Ludke, as well as many advocates here today. Screening children is an essential first step. Today, we look at what more can be done. Thank you very much for joining us. I hope you return for future fearless conversations as well. The breakouts this afternoon will be a first step in what we hope is an ongoing conversation on how we tackle this critical issue. The School of Public Policy commits itself to being a part of the solution. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you here this morning and for joining us in this important conversation. It's now my great pleasure to turn over to our fellow event host, Dr. Karen Salmon, the State Superintendent of Schools. Dr. Salmon. Thank you, Dean, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I am... Um, so excited to uh, talk about this incredibly important topic. Um, you know, uh, we all know how incredibly important it is for our children to be able to learn to read. Literacy is the bedrock of everything that we do in education. And, and so um, I, I wanna just uh, capitalize on the fact that, um, you know, we wanna make sure that literacy becomes the bedrock of our educational content. We know that with strong literacy skills, our students are able to take advantage of everything that education has to offer. And so um, within that is the whole issue though of equity and making sure that everybody is included in this all students. It's not just rhetoric, it means every, each and every one of our students needs to be included. Um, and, and have the opportunity to have incredible um, uh, instruction in literacy. Uh, it's been one of my uh, huge um, in initiatives uh, since I've been in this role. Uh, we were able to um, place a priority on, on equity across the board at the State Department of Education and then along with the State Board of Education issued a guide to educational equity for local school districts. 
And we have called for our local school districts to provide comprehensive literacy instruction that includes foundational reading skills. And we've also worked with each and every one of the districts to vet their curriculum to ensure that it's evidence-based and that we'll achieve what we need to achieve. It's also important to know that we've invested in our teachers uh, because they're the key to literacy. Uh, when teachers are given the knowledge, the skills, and the coaching uh, to support the science of reading, all students from every zip code uh, will benefit. We're very committed at the Maryland State Department of Education to the science of reading, and we're going to make sure that our school systems have the resources and the tools to implement this comprehensive literacy program. I especially believe we need to have an intense focus on literacy given the impact of this global pandemic on um, our education and our, on our students. And um, I really think that we all need to commit to um, uh, a laser-like focus on ensuring that all of our students, and again, all of our students will learn to read and then can graduate uh, college and career ready. So I wanna thank you all for taking the time to be involved in this uh, uh, summit today. And I want to also um, uh, say that I have the pleasure of, of introducing the uh, next keynote speaker, uh, Kelly Butler. Uh, Ms. Butler has played a key role in Mississippi's literacy transformation over the past two decades. She's the president and chief executive officer of the Barksdale Reading Institute, which is a nonprofit based in Oxford, Mississippi. The Barksdale Reading Institute was formed with the goal of improving the quality of public education in Mississippi through strategic literacy initiatives and providing professional development to teachers and administrators. The Barksdale Reading Institute has worked closely with the Mississippi Department of Education and one of my uh, colleagues, State Superintendent Dr. Carrie Wright, uh, to transform reading instruction in Mississippi. I'd also like to add that Dr. Wright is a friend and colleague to many of us in Maryland, as she is an alumni of the University of Maryland College Park and also worked in Prince George's, Howard and Montgomery County Public Schools before moving to Mississippi. She's been a great model for all of the rest of our Steve, uh, all of the rest of our state um, chief school officers and has often spoken to us about the improvement of reading uh, overall and literacy in Mississippi. Now, Ms. Uh, Butler will share how she's worked collaborative, collaboratively with education stakeholders in Mississippi, including local school districts, institutes of higher ed, the governor, state legislators, and advocacy groups to create a statewide change to pre-K through three reading instruction and professional learning. So I'm so excited to hear about this transformation. So I'm gonna welcome Ms. Kelly Butler to uh, join us. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really great to be here and I'm sorry I've missed uh, what's happened so far. Um, and thank you for those kind words of our uh, State Superintendent Carrie Wright. She is indeed a friend of Mississippi and we worry every day that we're going to lose her back to Maryland where she has daughters and grandchildren. <laughs> uh, so thank you, uh, Dr. Sam, for that. Um, I have a, just a few slides to tell this story that I feel like I've told a hundred times before and um, and we are continuing to work uh, very closely with the State Department here to, to build on the story um, that, that we've crafted so far. So if I may share my screen, I'm gonna walk you through, I think visually it helps to see, um, see this uh, graphically. Let me see if I can make this. Can you all see that? Yes, we can, thank you. Thank you, okay. Um, so I begin with um, this uh, particular slide because um, Kelly, can you pause for a second? I'm so sorry, I just accidentally muted you. So now I, I'm, I'm asking you to unmute. You should be able to unmute yourself. Okay. There you go, sorry about that. Um, I share this uh, banner uh, from Emily Hanford's work. She came, she paid a visit to us and spent a number of days here looking at the work that we were doing um, around Mississippi and specific to literacy. I know that you all 
um, have all heard the really great work that she's done and I send my regards out to her if she's in this audience at the moment. I know she's on the docket today. Um, but this kind of set the tone for, for really what the message is that I hope to convey today, which is we figured out how to teach reading the right way and we made sure people knew how to do it. And that in a nutshell is what states need to do. And uh, we think we have a pretty clear roadmap uh, for how to do that, even though um, there, it may not be a cookie cutter approach. We think there's some really important lessons um, in this process. So let me, it's not letting me advance my slides. There we go. Um, so this is the long view, the story behind that headline. Um, and it begins in the year 2000 uh, when the Barksdale Reading Institute was created by uh, the generous commitment of Jim Barksdale of $100 million to the University of Mississippi. This is an important date because it's also the year that the National Reading Panel produced its seminal report. And so we really hit the ground running with the parlance of the science of reading and um, took it upon ourselves to, to take seriously uh, what that meant and to try to embed it at every level in the system. So what you're gonna see, we're gonna march across this graph and kind of see how both Barksdale has planted some seeds and done some important work as a neutral broker, but also um, as someone who was very serious and focused solely on early literacy. Um, and then you will also see some of the state actions that took place. Some of those are integral with uh, the Institute and some of those were, um, were independent, but we have been good partners throughout. So the yellow errors that you're gonna see are really Barksdale actions and the um, turquoise areas are um, related to state actions. And in some cases we, we were really working together uh, and I'll try to highlight those as we go. So um, in 2000, we were formed and between 2000 and 2003, one of the very first things the Institute did um, was to fund eight fact, uh, 12 faculty at the eight public universities um, in the teacher preparation programs with the primary purpose of making sure that the National Reading Report findings and what we knew at that point in time about the science of reading was being introduced to pre-service candidates from the very beginning. At the same time, we were focusing on work in the, um, in the different schools. We were using an early coaching model that we have really kind of honed over time and um, introducing high quality materials and um, providing instructional coaches. And that was really the, 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 the model that, that became the Boxdale model and we'll see later how it was taken to scale by the state. In 2003, uh, the Institute um, decided that we needed to, to review and evaluate what we were doing in those teacher prep programs and whether or not the funding and the support we were providing to those faculty was, was making a difference. And it turned out, in fact, that was my introduction to the Institute. I did that first study um, and it was pretty telling. Um, again, it was only 12 faculty in the eight institutions. We have 14 teacher prep programs in Mississippi. Um, but the, uh, the findings were really pretty stark. And we were focused because we were coming off of the National Reading Panel's early findings around the importance of explicit phonics. We were really very interested in looking at how that was playing out um, in these teacher prep programs. And the, and the finding essentially was, it was a pretty much a time study. We looked closely at exactly what was happening over the course of, of, these, of the reading requirements that were in place at the time. And it was a scattershot. It was all over the map. We, we found that in some cases you could go to any one, not one of these public in institutions and not learn what all five components of reading were, much less how to teach them. So from there, the Institute worked with the State Department and some of the higher ed faculty to create um, a requirement. We proposed to the State Department a requirement that every uh, institution that was preparing elementary majors needed to offer six hours of early reading instruction. Those two courses are now embedded as, across the state. Uh, we call them Early Literacy One, which covers phonological awareness, phonics, concepts of print, and Early Literacy Two, which covers fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. 
And we're going to revisit that again because we've done a second study uh, more recently about what progress we've made on that front. But that was an important um, piece of, of a policy that got put into place to advance the science in a, in a more embedded way. Um, between 2005 and 2007, a couple of things were occurring. Uh, the Institute was really focused. We were in a, about 80 schools. We've been in about 120 altogether across the, the two decades that we've been in existence. But in this period of time, we were really focusing on two primary things, and that was um, building um, a network of schools uh, by providing this really intensive coaching with highly specialized that we had trained um, coaches and using high quality materials in their in their classrooms. This was a very intensive effort. And during this period, we it became really apparent that that in order to provide professional development to, to faculty to, to classroom teachers, they needed a whole lot more background than they had. Um, and we developed at that time a 38 week course, which in, in some ways is was a precursor to um, to letters. Um, it, if, this, if I'd known that Louisa Motes was working on letters at the time, I, I would have uh, jumped ship and, and done that with her. But we ended up creating a pretty intensive, um, what we call the reading universe model, um, which is a kind of a crash course on everything you need to know about teaching reading. And so that was part of the professional development. The model then was at the school level, providing an, a highly trained coach, highly qu high quality materials in the classrooms. At that point in time, we were using ReadWell, which is an explicit phonics approach. Um, um, and then we were also introducing the Reading Universe professional development. So there was intensive work across the state at that time. In 2007, um, was the first year that make the, uh, the state funding formula was fully funded. And so we began to see some impetus from that. So you notice this climb beginning uh, here between 2005 and 2009. Um, in 2009, we had, uh, we had created a, a pre-K program called Mississippi Building Blocks. And in 2009, the legislature picked it up and began to fund it. It became a precursor to uh, another um, piece of the legislature that Carrie Wright introduced uh, around early learning collaboratives, which we'll talk about in a minute. But that was, again, kind of a partnership with Barksdale and the state legislature to finally get pre-K um, programs on the, on the radar. In 2010, you see where we began to experience a little bit of a slide. What is happening there is the college and career ready standards were introduced. The State Department was highly focused on helping schools adapt instruction based on those standards and also worked really hard in developing a much stronger accountability model for the state. During that period, we did a number of um, trials with state testing and the, with the sole goal of trying to get the state testing much more aligned uh, to the NAEP test. And, and that was a strategic piece that I think really made a difference because we were very far, our state testing were, uh, were very weak in terms of what we were really measuring there. Uh, Barksdale at the, and during this period of time also introduced a school leadership project where we actually, um, for lack of a better word, took over four schools, uh, hired the principal, hired a coach, uh, provided all the literacy support. And the point in that was we learned a lot in our demonstration classrooms around um, uh, how difficult it was to change practice in a school if the school leader wasn't on board. And so that was a, a part of the work that we were doing during that during that time. All right, 2013 is a big year. This is the year we passed the Literacy Based Promotion Act. And um, the literacy, this is our third grade law. And we were involved in advising the legislature and working with the State Department when these discussions came about. A lot of us had a lot of concern about this because we were fearful that it would become a real focus on retention and put the burden on the back of nine year olds. But in this collaborative effort, the State Department and Barksdale partnered with the State Department to develop the rollout for the Literacy Based Promotion Act. There was a clear decision early on that we were gonna focus on the adults and not on retaining kids. And so the big push was to um, uh, provide coaching, 
provide uh, good professional development and again to introduce and monitor the kind of quality of materials that were being used. In that first year, the Literacy Based Promotion Act funded uh, $9 million to get that off the ground. We recommended uh, letters as the statewide professional development um, program and we did that. There were, um, there were a few things on the market at the time, but letters um, was well packaged. They were very amenable to creating a Mississippi uh, rollout with us. Um, and, and one of the, I think, important features of our success is that we selected a single professional development um, curriculum that everybody got, uh, school leaders, classroom teachers, and ultimately the faculty. And, um, and I think that's a real, a real important piece for states to consider. Uh, what we've learned from other states is that when you send the money down to the district level, you get a thousand flowers blooming. And um, while some training may be better than others, if it's not really the same kind of language, even though it's the same science, um, it can cause some confusion. And so I would, would urge other states to take that model, even though it's sort of counter to our notions of local control, it's kind of like vaccination. You need to do it from the, from the top down. Um, Carrie Wright arrived during this period, which was a great gift to us. She hit the ground running also with a very clear focus on early literacy. So we were now uh, looking at the Literacy Based Promotion Act. She totally reorganized the State Department to focus on early literacy. There was never an early literacy or elementary reading uh, department before she got there. And so there was a real effort and focus um, to at the state level to, to get this right. And she invited us in as partners. And it's really this model that Barksdale had been honing between that 2005 and 2010 period that went to scale with the Literacy Based Promotion Act. Nine million in the first year and 15 million thereafter every year. Um, in 2014, we introduced a kindergarten readiness assessment and that has proven to be very revealing. Um, we, uh, that was the year that the third grade assessment was crafted in order to get ready for implementation uh, of, the, of the law the following year. In that year, Barksdale came in and did a second study. We went back to the commissioner of higher ed because we recognized that if we're gonna spend $15 million a year to retrain teachers, maybe we needed to take another look at what was happening in teacher preparation and whether or not that early literacy one and two coursework was getting the job done. This time, all 15, 14 at, this, at that point, public institutions and private institutions were interested in. So the dean stepped up voluntarily um, to participate in this study. Um, I know my friend Kate Walsh is here listening and she and I have been good friends through this process. And she had just come off uh, her early, one of her early reviews and everybody was upset at her. And so they were willing to talk to me about what was happening in their, in their programs. I wanna give a shout out to Kate because I think she's done a phenomenal job of stirring this pot and really paving the way for some of us to come in behind her and do some of the deeper digging. Um, so 2014 was the year that we did that. Um, and it took a couple of years to do that. So the beginning in 2015 through, you'll see um, the current time, we are continuing to provide letters training. We have now recently this past year added secondary teachers uh, and principals so that we can expand the knowledge of the science of reading upwards. In 2016, uh, the governor decided he wanted to create a task force because we had completed our study and we found pretty much the same thing. While most programs were teaching all five components of reading, um, they still weren't doing a very good job of it. There was very little modeling going on. Um, the textbooks they were using were all over the place and many of them really were promoting balanced literacy. This governor was very interested in making sure that that those recommendations that came out of the, of the study were implemented. And from that grew what has become now our professional growth model. Uh, so in 2017, we created something called the Mississippi Momentum Model, which is a professional growth for faculty. 
Um, the State Department, again, partnered with us, giving us 40 slots of their letters training, and we created a faculty-only cohort for letters. Um, we hired the best national trainer we, we found, uh, who now works for the Barksdale Reading Institute, Antonio Fierro, and he trained all of our faculty, and he essentially replicated what was happening with the K-3 teachers um, under the Literacy-Based Promotion Act, and that was to provide coaching, modeling, and um, some support on site in their classrooms. Um, the banners you see behind me are some of the um, instruments that we've used uh, to try to introduce the science of reading across the state. So now these conceptual models are really embedded in this professional growth model. Again, consistency, everybody's getting the same, the same dose. Um, from 2017 to 2019, each year, $15 million has been poured into this. Um, the, the literacy based, I mean, the Mississippi momentum model that is the faculty is about to conclude this year and we are um, going to be refunded again. Kellogg helped us with this project. Kellogg has done a lot of support in Mississippi. Um, and they uh, are, are interested in doing another cohort, this time for early learning, early literacy and um, special education faculty. So that will, we hope, commence uh, in the fall. In the meantime, the third grade scores uh, have, have continued to go up. We raised the bar uh, midway through and, um, and we didn't lose any ground in the process because we really felt like teachers were um, uh, uh, really getting what they needed. And, as, and once we saw the state blanketed with really much more effective reading instructions, kids began to read. Um, that brings us all the way to 2021. Um, and this year we are initiating a multi-state initiative. We've gotten calls from about 20 states who are interested in what we're doing in Mississippi specific to teacher preparation. And um, so we're starting a program, um, we call it the Path Forward and it is to bring state teams together. Uh, we've just selected our six, uh, first six states to participate um, in this project. So I have a few slides about um, about how this model worked and then I'll be done and we'll entertain some questions. That's a handout we can give to you. That's kind of the roadmap of what I just talked about. Um, here's our Mississippi Momentum Partnership. You'll see from these logos that it was really a collaboration between the Higher Ed Literacy Council, the State Department, um, the Higher Ed Commissioner, the Governor's Office um, and the, the Reading Institute. There are four central components to this model. One is that um, we made, wanted to make sure evidence-based content was consistent across the system. Uh, this grid you see on the right, which is hard to read, is actually the Mississippi matrix of early literacy skills. And it's designed to get everybody on the page, whether you're a literacy coach, a K-3 teacher, a K-3 principal, or a pre-service candidate or faculty member. We're all following um, these same uh, content standards and they're pretty much driven by the IDA standards, which we find to be the most nuanced. The second component is to establish this learning community across faculty, creating a safe space for faculty to acknowledge that their own advanced degree programs did not prepare them for the science of reading. We talked a lot about not just content, but how you deliver effective instruction and how you do it explicitly. So this is a, a, a photograph of um, our faculty working um, together on that. The third component is this coaching and modeling, again, from the early Barksdale model that's been used now with the Literacy Based Promotion Act for K-3. We did it at the faculty level. So this is Antonio doing his magic um, with a group of faculty, um, both on site and here at the Institute. And the fourth component is really important, which is that we take the foundations of the science of reading, which we know to be um, really established what Louisa calls the settled science and um, embed all of the, of the instruction in these four conceptual models so that um, everything that we do across those both those six hours and now ultimately 15 hours of required reading are all anchored on this, um, this body of the science. So the traction we're graining uh, is with these other states who are interested in trying to replicate what we've done here. We think there's some certain improvements that we could make and we've learned a lot in the process. The six states that we are working with are Arizona, Colorado, Massachusetts, Missouri, North Carolina, and Ohio. 
And at the end of this month, we will launch this. And so we are eager to share the findings as we go, go forward. So to recap, this is essentially really the, I think what made the magic happen. And it was really a comprehensive approach. Um, it was grounded on a lot of um, experimentation and work by the Institute up to the point of the Literacy-Based Promotion Act. Um, but I think the most important error on this, um, this whole slide is that we did a statewide and uniform professional development and coaching in the science of reading at all levels. Um, and it really needs to kind of happen simultaneously um, uh, for folks to, to get it and to, to be able to talk about it um, together. So I will entertain questions. Wonderful. If folks want to direct questions um, to DJ Bulger and um, the host, you can click to DJ and he can feed them. We already do have one. Who are the first six states and is one of them Maryland? Uh, those first six states were Arizona, um, Colorado, Missouri, North Carolina, um, Massachusetts, and uh, we did talk with some folks from Maryland. I don't know off the top of my head who those were, um, but they are on the list of the 20 states that we talked to. And um, the states were selected for a couple of reasons for cohort one, those particular six states. One had to do with the, um, the, the amount of uh, activity that was going on already with, um, with teacher preparation and with uh, some legislative activity. Um, in most of these cases, the governor's office is involved and has an investment in uh, the work that's happening around literacy. A couple of the states have these comprehensive literacy um, funds from the feds uh, and that was we were trying to put together a constellation of states that had kind of different dynamics um, and so that's one reason and we also were cognizant that we were doing having to switch to do this virtually we started out before the pandemic and and so to what extent could states tolerate this level of work um, in a virtual environment our goal is to create and we've got a lineup ready for cohort two um, by the end of the summer, we hope to be past this pandemic and able to meet in the fall of next year uh, to share learnings of cohort one and to bring on board a second cohort. Um, so we'd love to stay in conversation with Marilyn. So, and then the, the, one of the questions was, how can we get on cohort two? <laughs> well, this is a good beginning because it shows a lot of, um, a lot of investment on the part of many people and that's really, that's what we learned in Mississippi is we got to, that, that this is too connected and we can't, we can no longer operate in silos. And one of the um, ad additional questions was uh, the studies that were done, um, that, that, were they done by Barksdale? Were they done by another outside independent organization? And, and um, if you could describe kind of what the content or what kind of the, the studies, um, what they, you know, how they were enacted. Um, the first study was much smaller because it was only the eight public institutions. And I did that with an in-house team, um, uh, but it was a very deep dive. We took, it took a full year to, to get it done. And each institution got a, an individual report of what we found. It was looking through the lens of um, what was the requirement of those six hours of the, or of the current reading requirements, which led to the six hours. So we were looking closely at what is the national reading panel telling us that first study was back in 2003. So we were all really new to that. That was also in the early reading first days. Um, so we were looking at coursework. We were looking at syllabus, um, the syllabus and the course schedules. What happens in the course schedule is much more telling than what a syllabus can sometimes tell you. We were looking at the quality of textbooks and we were looking at it through the lens of uh, did it address the five components and to what extent was it uh, connected to the, to the evidence-based practices that we knew at the time. Um, we determined in that, it was really kind of a time study. We actually calibrated how much time based on coursework and also corroborated by interviews and focus groups actually how much time was being spent both to learn about the five components and then actually teach them and practice them. And so one of the staggering findings early on was on average, it was about 20 minutes total of coursework during a two year preparation 
that junior and senior year on how to teach phonics. And it wasn't being done very well. I mean, can't do much in 20 minutes anyway, but there was very little modeling. There was a lot of activities um, happening then. Uh -huh. So as we built in those two courses, we really helped to try to shape what that meant to teach phonics uh, and the, all foundational skills much more explicitly. The 2014-15 study uh, was bigger. It included all 15 of the institutions. I had a, I built a better team and brought in some folks from, uh, from externally from partners we'd worked with in the country um, who were uh, deeply ensconced in the science of reading. And we did a very similar thing. Um, Again, we did focus groups. We talked to every dean, every faculty member. Um, we did focus groups with pre-service candidates. We observed pre-service candidates out in the field. We observed recent graduates out in the field. We interviewed mentor teachers and supervisors. Um, the needle had moved. We determined that with the exception of one program, all of the course descriptions did include or list the, science, the five components of reading. But again, we saw very little modeling uh, we saw one of the things that was disturbing to me was only in about 50% of the cases was it clear what the objective for learning was day to day in these courses. Um, and, and often that's the, the, the objective, even if it was never explicitly stated, was really unrelated to what needed to be happening in the six hours of course, of course work. We've gotten a, a lot of pushback from faculty saying there's just not enough time to do it all. And what the second study really revealed is how much time is wasted and how much time is out of scope. So while it may be important to know how to engage parents, if you've got six hours to teach the five components of reading and how to, how to teach and assess them, you need to talk about parent engagement somewhere else. Um, and so that's part of what we try to do is kind of tighten up the, the curriculum. And uh, Maryland has passed a, a screening bill, but in terms of, uh, and this is a conversation we've had before, but uh, what, um, A, can we get more information on the, on the you know, screeners, the early screeners that um, you, you have used, but what, um, what were some of the kind of uh, rules about what, what screeners could be used? Good question. We have one of the things that was part of the Literacy Based Motion Act was creation of a literacy of, of a reading panel, which uh, Barksdale sat on. Uh, and my colleague, Kim Yana Burke, who you're going to hear from later today, was also, was also at the time on that panel. And we, that one of the purposes of that panel was to look at the assessment, both the third grade assessment as well as the screeners. Um, so we uh, poured through uh, as many screeners as we could find. Um, and ultimately selected five. Uh, the criteria is essentially was that did they were they able to screen all five components of reading and how um, how uh, validated were they in terms of those early foundational skills? Uh, Kimiana, you should ask that question for her because she can tell you much more about those. We are revisiting some of those screeners. We have found a couple of them to be used much more widely than others, and we have found some flaws in the ones that we're using. And how about the older students? So were there, um, was there anything that was in place to help older students in the process of so secondary or, or, you know, late, uh, late elementary or second uh, or secondary students? Uh, somewhat. The State Department, uh, of course, at this point in time was really focused on getting this K to three right because it was going to solve the problem longitudinally. Uh, but Kim Yana, again, who comes from a secondary background, was very sensitive to the fact in her state role that, um, that middle and high school kids were continuing uh, to struggle. Barksdale at the time, I didn't talk about this on the original slide, but we were also working to create a model of instruction for middle and high school students. Today, we are doing two more studies that are related to that. What happens to kids after the fourth grade? Why do so many of them continue to struggle? Is that a curriculum issue? Is it still an instructional issue? And we're, pat we're following them all the way out through uh, post-graduation because we know that, 40, at least in Mississippi, 42% of our graduates end up eligible for developmental education. So we're working now with community colleges and the four-year institutions to see what happens to students who continue to struggle all the way through the pipeline. Um, so stay tuned on that. We hope to be producing more about what we're learning there. Um, and so we probably have time for, I guess, one more here. Um, I'll, I'll 
I'll put the, um, are the resources of, uh, available online? And I'm, I think I'm sure at Barksdale at your website, they are. They are, our website actually is under construction right now, but I'll also will uh, share with you that the Reading Universe, um, which is that 38 week course that I talked about that used to be in a three reading binder is now becoming a, a website. We have a very rudimentary website uh, currently constructed, but we are partnering with uh, uh, WTA Reading Rockets in DC and Face uh, First Book uh, to roll out a very robust Reading Universe um, website, which we are really excited about. Uh, we've gotten a lot of interest in some good funders to make this um, a, a go-to place for any teacher in K-6 or uh, pre-K-6, um, faculty, um, parents. It's going to be a really terrific, lots of videos, lots of modeling, lots of tools and templates for, uh, for, for folks to use. We do have a few now on our website, but um, it's, we're kind of under, under construction. So. And the, the last one, and this is one that's um, great leads so great lead into the, the panel, but um, many other state departments seem to have a lot more power over districts. Uh, and so what um, what do you recommend for districts that um, or this balance of power between local control and, and, and statewide control? But what do you recommend for districts that aren't interested in making changes or want to stick with things such as uh, guided reading or other practices? Well, I sometimes think it depends on the constellation and uh, the complexion co composition of the district. I mean, the players, the actors. Because um, we do have some successful districts here who are all using guided reading. Um, but, it, you know, there's some factors there that, that, that contribute to that. One is they also have really strong pre-K programs, both public and private. And so kids come to school much readier to read. And, uh, we are, we know that about 50% of kids are going to read no matter what we do, uh, but it's those 50% that, that are under the radar in too many places um, that are not getting the attention. So I would say that um, we now have, the good news is we now have some, some districts that are really illustrating what, what can happen if you blanket uh, instruction with this evidence-based practices. We have a whole state now that's, that's demonstrating that. Um, and there's no reason not to do it uh, uh, for those kids and the others are gonna benefit as well. So I guess uh, my, my advice would be, while we, we are wedded to, to local control, uh, there are some things that, um, that are working in lots of places that, that just ought to become um, statewide. Oh, many thanks. Um, so now we're going to transition to our uh, next panel and uh, our distinguished moderator, uh, uh, Dr. Nancy Grasmick, who has uh, headed our uh, State Department of Education uh, for many, many years and, and has been uh, um, well regarded in, in her time and tenure in doing that. And uh, so I uh, welcome uh, Nancy and uh, our uh, distinguished uh, panelists, uh, including uh, Kareem Weaver, who is joining us from Oakland. Uh, luckily, we didn't uh, ask him to speak in the morning because, you know, speaking at five o'clock was probably a little, little too early. <laughs> um, and uh, Dr. Sonia Santalisis, uh, our CEO of Baltimore City Public Schools. Uh, Dr. Kimiana Burke, uh, who comes up from, to us from Excellence in Education and, and formerly, uh, as uh, Kelly mentioned, uh, worked uh, alongside Kerry oh Wright in the Mississippi uh, State Department of Education, and uh, Dr. Britt Kerwin, uh, our uh, distinguished former chancellor of the USM system, and uh, now the head of the uh, improvement. Uh, All right, um, so I'll turn it over uh, to Dr. Grasmick um, to uh, ask the first questions to our panelists. Certainly, and before I do that, I'd just like to commend Kelly Butler for her presentation and to um, just give a statement that is actually an accumulation of all of, of many of the things which she said. I think you need a strong State Department of Education. I think there has to be screening if we're going to really um, find the solutions to the um, problem of literacy that we experience throughout this country. And I think that screening is 
essential in terms of the circumstances of the students we're serving. I think teacher preparation and continued professional development is absolutely in, important as well as administrators at the individual school level who are knowledgeable about the implementation. Um, I think a strong curriculum as she suggested. I think um, certainly engaging other people and that is people who understand policy development there has to be a political will, and that political will has to provide resources to be able to implement. And that often involves philanthropy, since there's no single way of funding all of these initiatives. So one of the outstanding questions is, how do we ensure continuity and sustainability? Because leadership changes. And often we have exemplary programs that begin, but are not sustained. So they're just um, a, a series of questions to be asked and answered. I'd like to now move to asking each of the panelists if they would take no more than two minutes, but to really um, tell us about their experiences and their background in terms of this issue of literacy and equity. Could we begin with you, um, Mr. Weaver? Sure, so my experience and background with this, well, we're out in Oakland, California. I'm a longtime educator and we finally got to the point where we, um, we realized something had to be done. And at the NAACP, which is the organization I work with, um, we felt like we we're putting Band-Aids on things. And so we did a root cause analysis and found out that this is a at the heart of our challenges and decided to engage universities, publishers, K-12 systems, parents, and nonprofit organizations and media around this issue of literacy and really thought about um, what are the right questions we need to be asking and how do we need to set the situation up so that we weren't just you know, offering more, or offering something in addition to, but really challenging, really getting people to demand what their kids need to get a, um, a good education on literacy. So um, it's been fascinating. We, we've done quite a bit so far. Uh, we've gone from a small outfit that, you know, knocked on a few doors to uh, being able to work with folks on the state level um, around, you know, getting mandatory dyslexia screening um, that's in the pipeline or the, the K-12 systems to consider um, their curriculum and what they've adopted or you know, universities to look at their syllabi and uh, figure out are there, are there classes aligned foundational skills level or parents getting them up to speed on the science of reading, et cetera. So these are the kinds of things we've been working on. Um, it's a continuation of what I had been doing as a classroom teacher and a principal and you know, working in nonprofit space for years. So that's where we're Thank at in you. Oakland right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. Santolisis, it's wonderful to see you and um, to be on a panel with you, um, having worked with Dr. Santolisis for many years. So would you introduce yourself um, really focused on literacy and equity? Sure, so just by way of quick introduction, uh, Sonia Santolis is CEO of City Schools. Always good to see you again, Dr. Grasnick. Um, and, and everyone else. Um, and I will just quickly say by way of introduction, um, the issues of literacy and equity for me are certainly um, you know, a professional focus, which I know we'll get into more, but I think it's also important to, for, for me, my driver is the personal intersection. Um, and very quickly, I remember sitting with my mother who grew up in the Jim Crow South in Georgia, which is what's encouraging to hear about the work going on in places like Mississippi and Tennessee. When I learned very late, I was leading in Baltimore City as CAO, when I found out from her that it was actually against the law for schools that taught black children to use phonics and phonetic code, that they were not allowed to actually teach that way. And when I looked at that and then looked at the black literacy rates um, 
during the Great Migration and realized that percentage wise as a nation, we were actually educating more, um, at least black children, black citizens to a point of literacy during the Great Migration than we were in Baltimore City um, at the time that I was leading. That for me is, is one of the kind of personal examples of why this discussion of literacy and equity, both my own mother who fortunately like did learn to read, she was part of that 50% who learned to read anyway um, and went on to college and other things, but then also looking at it um, really as a reflection point uh, for us as a country. And so as an education leader, um, that personal drive has always um, impacted a lot of the professional work that I know we're gonna talk about later on. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Burke, would you give us a two minute introduction to yourself as it relates to equity and literacy? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'll start by saying this. I was, I wanted to be an attorney. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, right. So my undergraduate degree is political science. Um, I decided to take a year and I said, well, I'll just, I'll substitute teach. Uh, during that time, I taught reading at an elementary school and of course fell in love with it. Um, but I did go the alternate route. Uh, I was a, a secondary teacher. I love teaching English. But when I got to the high school, I became a literacy coach. And it became very evident that we had so many students in high school that, uh, who were struggling readers. And the questions that I had in my mind was really, how many teachers failed you? You know, how did you get here um, with, uh, with, with all of these uh, you know, deficiencies in reading and challenges? And so that's when I began to do my uh, additional graduate work in early childhood and reading. So um, a little while after that, Mississippi did pass its Literacy-Based Promotion Act in 2013, and I was selected to lead that statewide effort. Uh, no pressure, right? Uh, Mississippi was, you know, at the bottom, had been for decades, uh, but this was our time to say we could either go big or go home. We had funding to support our efforts, and during this time, I believe we we, we were able to to um, allow others to see that the Department of Education was not just a compliance agency and that we were here to support you. And, and with all of that work from several um, stakeholders that I'll talk about a little bit later, uh, we were able to just achieve unprecedented gains. And so I'm just excited to be here today to talk a little bit more about um, you know, literacy and equity, especially in a state like Mississippi. Thank you. Dr. Kerwin, how nice to see you. And you. here's a person who spent <laughs> very recent years in terms of this issue and really um, focusing on it for our entire state. So Dr. Kerwin, would you just give us the two minutes of your efforts, which well, are huge you. in terms of literacy yeah. and um, equity? Well, thank you, uh, Nancy. Always great to be with, uh, with you. Uh, yes, my name is Britt Kerwin. I am the Chancellor Emeritus of the University System of Maryland. Um, uh, earlier in my career, I was uh, a mathematics professor at University of Maryland College Park and had the privilege of serving as president of that university for uh, a number of years. And so I just want to commend uh, Jennifer Rice and my colleagues in the College of Education for putting on this uh, forum. I've been here since 830 and it's, been, it's just been uh, fabulous. Um, I am probably the least expert in literacy of anybody that's participating today. So why am I on the panel, you might ask. Uh, for those of you who aren't in Maryland, it's because um, I was asked to chair uh, by the governor and the General Assembly, a commission on innovation and excellence uh, to uh, make major recommendations on reform of pre-K through 12 education in Maryland uh, with the goal of having Maryland schools perform at the level of the best performing school systems in the world. Um, and uh, so um, I, 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 we obviously spent a lot of time thinking and working on the issue of literacy and I think have some very important recommendations uh, that we can talk about later uh, that relate to uh, the topics that have been discussed today uh, uh, surrounding literacy. Thank you, thank all of you. Um, I'd like to turn now to Dr. Burke. 
And I'd like to um, say that we certainly heard a lot about the plans from Kelly Butler um, in terms of the K to three reading policy uh, with the very heavy focus on um, supporting successful policy implementation. Um, what are the key elements to really developing and implementing a unified state plan? Yeah, so um, I believe having a successful state plan, it starts with a strategic collaboration just among our stakeholders, uh, specifically our legislators uh, and our state education agency leaders. You know, those who will be uh, passing those laws and those who will be helping the facilitation of, of the implementation of those laws. And it also helped greatly that we had a governor, uh, former Governor Bryant, um, who was just a champion um, for literacy. Governor Bryan is dyslexic. He's talked about it a lot. Um, and so it was his goal to ensure that all of our readers, were, all of our, our students were, were reading by the end of third grade. Um, the Foundation for Excellence in Education, um, whom I work for now, uh, was also played a role in, in the model policy and helping us to achieve that. So when you adopt a comprehensive policy as Mississippi did, which is really modeled after, after Florida's policy, it should include those elements, um, some of which you mentioned earlier, um, Nancy, as it relates to professional development and training. A lot of people do just really talk about the teacher training, but we do know that our administrators who will be responsible for, uh, for monitoring, providing feedback to teachers if they need to be trained, and also our professors in our, in our colleges of education, as Kelly mentioned earlier, um, who are responsible for preparing our teachers. Uh, it also helped that our policy came with funding. Um, we did have funding first year, nine and a half million dollars. There are so many states that in their first years they received um, 20 million or 40 million dollars. We had nine and a half million dollars and we had to do what we needed to do in order to make that work. Um, so within, um, with those funds, we invested in universal screening for students. We ensured that parents were going to be notified uh, immediately upon um, understanding or knowing that their, their child had a deficiency in reading. And then also progress monitoring and intensive interventions. So uh, all of these elements are documented in, in model policy. So it's not just what we did though. So if, if that's the case, you know, anybody could do that. You take these elements and you just do them, but it's really not that simple. You know, it's the implementation piece. Once you pass the policy, what's the implementation and how strong is it? Um, and how effective is it? So with us, a very strong leader, Dr. Carrie Wright, uh, who was just amazing and, and was just really amazing for me to work alongside her um, those years. And with that, uh, with that strong leadership and consistent leadership, um, we look to our district and also our local level leaders to ensure that implementation was taking place on the ground. On the ground also included from the State Department literacy coaches. I, I, I want to just really um, make it very clear that professional development alone uh, is not going to get it. With our literacy coaches in those schools, and we initially placed our literacy coaches in our lowest performing schools in the state based on data, with coaches in those schools as boots on the ground to support teachers in the transfer of their knowledge to the actual classroom, to their actual students, to provide them that feedback, to, to assist them in, in changing their practice, that was also key uh, to how we were able to um, to make those gains. When we began making gains in places like the Delta and our teachers begin to see the success, our students, our families in those communities begin to see that type of success and believe in their, their, their teachers and those schools, then we really started just kind of like a firestorm across the state where we had other school districts calling to say, can I get one of your literacy coaches? And I would say, well, you, your students will actually have to not do well to get a coach. <laughs> so <laughs> what we want. So other districts that didn't have MDE literacy coaches began to invest in their own coaches and ask MDE to train them because they wanted to be consistent in the approach that we were taking. Other things such as district adoption of high quality instructional materials, 
um, and really just accountability at all levels, including teacher pre preparation. So I really commend the University of Maryland's um, College of Education for, for being a partner in this today. Um, and I'll just close with this. We are in the middle of a pandemic, unprecedented times that has really uncovered um, a lot of the academic and social gaps uh, that those of us who have been working in, in, in impoverished communities like I, I had when I taught, um, we knew existed, but now the nation knows uh, just how large those gaps are. This is a time where I have seen in my role as, as early literacy policy director and working with legislators across the country that we now have governors, we have legislators, we have other stakeholders who are now committed to doing something about it and to addressing these gaps, um, specifically through policy. So uh, I just want to commend, you know, of course, everyone on the panel and then those of us and, and those of you who are who are in this work and, and really trying to make a change based on what we've seen. Um, especially over the last year. Thank you. I will have additional questions uh, later, I'm sure. I'd like to ask Mr. Weaver, you um, spoke about the uh, NAACP's advocacy in Oakland and um, what you were doing relative to advancing that effort. Um, what do you see as the follow-up and how are the local and state administrations working with you on these goals? And do you feel that it's unified in terms of those local entities working it collaboratively? Um, well, let me start with unity. No, it's not unified. Um, it's moving in the right direction. Um, I mean, the state, the county, and the city, uh, the, the local school district folks are beginning to align around things such as foundational skills and things like that. But in general, no. Um, you know, part of our work has been to work with stakeholders at the very top of the state um, and, and districts and organizations just recalibrating everyone's expectations about what's possible. With our district partners, we have to help them understand um, that they're being sold what are called minimally, minimally viable products, meaning the publishers are selling them what they think they need to sell them in order to close the deal. Very few of them say no. And so rather than just looking at the bumper sticker, reading the brochure and having a few demo lessons, you have to go deeper and demand more. Closing the gap for expectations, um, not just at the publisher level, but, uh, but also at the state level, as some of the rules we have and regulations around you know, how to access grant funding, et cetera, um, have to be tightened up. So I'd say expectations, recalibrating that one is our biggest, our biggest issue, and even with the community and parents, you know, we've heard for so long about what our kids can and can't do. That's at some level, we start to internalize that. And we just can't afford to do that. We have to be our kids greatest champion. The NAACP is really kind of holding the line in terms of um, making sure everyone is operating from a, an asset lens, that our kids can do it, our children are brilliant, and that uh, we have to have high expectations throughout the system, both in terms of um, what we expect from the kids and also what we expect from each other. Do you, do you feel support from the political entities in, um, in Oakland? Yes, they're drinking from a fire hose right now, though. you know, uh, not just because of the pandemic, but because these issues, you know, 18% of black kids in Oakland are reading English. When you have numbers like that, and you have the NAACP breathing down your neck, it's not comfortable. So we have good relationships with them. And at the same time, like I always say, we're not, we're not friends, we're allies. I mean, we have the same goals. This isn't a buddy-buddy type thing. So often in education, we fall into the trap of, you know, just wanting to, um, you know, we stay in that comfort zone with the colleagues that we've known for years and respect. Um, there is engagement. Um, you know, we meet with folks, we, have, we hold very hard lines, um, but we, we try to do so with grace. And we try to push them uh, because part of the challenge is it's not just a technical fix. I, I, some of the panelists earlier talked about this. It's not just a technical fix. There are some adaptive things that have to be done. 
we're talking about getting people to be vulnerable and admit that they don't know. That's difficult when whatever your position is within an organization, the idea that you might not know really can be threatening. What does that mean for my credibility? What does that mean for my team? How they look at me? What does that mean for my career? And so getting people within institutions to say, you know what? It's okay to be vulnerable. I'm gonna be the chief learner and communicate that to everyone that we're gonna make some intentional shifts and I'm gonna lead by example because I'm learning too, whether you're at a university or a K-12 system or at the county level or even at the state, um, if it's your board of education. That's something that you know, we're working on and I think that's probably our main work. It's not a technical thing, but it is such a huge piece of this puzzle. Hey, great. Thank you so much. And I'll be interested, I'll circle back to you, but I'll be interested in the funding um, plan for assisting this to take place. So Dr. Santelisis, I know when you return to Baltimore City as the um, CEO, you were absolutely adamant about literacy being, a, if not the top of the agenda. Um, and I guess it would be interesting to know um, just briefly why you chose that. And then because you did, what are the key elements of your strategy? And then what are you seeing as success? Sure, no, well, I, I think in entering back into the district um, as a number of people have, have stated already, um, and I think, you know, Mr. Weaver just said it, when you enter back, when I entered back and saw that we had, I think, 13.5% of students um, reading at the college and career ready level um, at that time as measured by Park, um, and even now, you know, with our current assessments, that, that in and of itself um, is an alarm. The other piece is, is knowing that without having the reading foundation, none of the other learning that we wanted young people to have exposure to was going to be possible. Um, and so that prioritization, and, and I will also say this because I think it's, it's important and um, you know, I have great, it's, it's great hearing Dr. Burke talk about her work with um, Carrie Wright and, and Carrie and I have had this conversation. I think some of it is what I saw was a lack of a point of view and clarity around what quality literacy instruction is. So people were allowed to be all over the map and having just left three and a half years before and thinking some things were in place and this gets to consistency of leadership as well. When the message is changing into the field, in the field to teachers, to principals about what quality literacy instruction is, um, then it's really hard to fully blame folks on the ground at the classroom level when the direction they're getting is coming from so many different places. So when we thought about the elements um, of what our strategy needed to be, um, the first was, was really opportunistic, to be honest, um, as a leader. What I heard from a lot of teachers was, we don't really have a set curriculum across the district. Um, the, you know, the kind of school-based decision-making, maybe you could do this, maybe you could do that around curriculum was not serving teachers well. And so from my standpoint, that was an opportunity and an entry point. It, it probably could be different in other places, um, but we started with discussions about um, curriculum materials and what are quality, high quality materials. And that was an entry point. I don't think it has to be that everywhere, but that discussion about what are high quality literacy materials was then an entry point um, through which we could have discussions with teachers. And um, some of my folks who are in the field, I think are on this call, people like Heather Bowles and others, who, who what, what we were finding is teachers actually did not know what the five essential components of literacy are, right? They did not know um, what guided reading um, was doing. And so the, what, what we began, what began with kind of a curriculum, a traditional curriculum adoption actually became an opportunity 
um, to share knowledge and to develop people's knowledge base. And I think when we develop people's knowledge base, that actually is what can help navigate, navigate changes in leadership. Because you and I both know, as do others on the call, you know, leaders will come and go. Uh, but yes. when you know what the components of high quality literacy instruction are, that can't really be taken from you. So first was high quality curriculum materials. The second really was, again, to Dr. Burke's point, um, this idea of what does on the ground support and professional learning need to look like. Um, we um, developed a, a intensive literacy sites, we, uh, learning sites, we call them ILS sites. We had support from the Gates Foundation with that. Um, so shout out to them for supporting that work. Um, and this gave us the opportunity to begin to create what I think um, you know, Mr. Weaver was spot on with when he said, we've got to give people permission to be vulnerable. And I think when you give people permission to be vulnerable, you also have to have a point of view. And what had happened um, was, you know, there were wishy-washy messages. And so at some point we had to kind of rip the Band-Aid off and say, you know that guided reading <laughs> series that we told you to do, we actually found it's not working for large portions of kids. Right, so let's together unpack. And we had, um, as part of the professional learning, as part of the coaching, as part of providing the support, we began to see um, that folks actually came to that realization and are coming to that realization themselves. Um, teachers who and principals who are like, I never knew, like nobody told me, um, and we didn't, we didn't make it through. So I think again, looking at what the opportunities are to bring people with you rather than just kind of send something out, um, making sure that what we've heard before, those uh, robust professional learning opportunities are there. Um, and then I, I do have to say this, particularly for traditionally underserved communities, re-emphasizing re the need for heavy content knowledge. Part of why we went with the curriculum materials we did is we, we were reaping years of messaging, particularly to low income school districts and communities that, well, we got to strip everything else from the curriculum because you all are so far behind. We just want you to do reading and we just want you to do math. And when we stripped away the science, when we stripped away the arts, when we stripped away social studies and history, we actually stripped away the actual learning um, the, the learning neurons and connections that young people needed to be able to match their knowledge with the actual decoding. So we had schools that were really actually outliers in terms of getting some of the fundamentals down. But when kids got to third grade, they saw similar stagnation. And when we looked at some of our early gains, our early gains really ironically have been in middle school. And a lot of that is because our middle school students had come from content anemic um, elementary school experiences. And so even doing far better partnering between science, social studies, arts, and those literacy connections um, and making sure people understand the brain science behind that, that this is not just the latest gobbledygook, you right. know, it's not just Dr. S's theory, there is brain science behind this that backs up how all kids learn. It's not just little brown children learn this way. It's not just English language learners learn this way. All children learn this way. And when we give all children the components they need, then all children can learn to read. Thank you. Very impressive. And so Dr. Kerwin, uh, we are all aware in the state of Maryland of the magnitude of the blueprint for Maryland. And we um, wait with anticipation at the ability to begin the implementation. But in terms of your leadership, which we thank you for, uh, we know there was a huge effort on both early childhood, which included literacy, and equity, as well as what we would consider in the more formalized grades of reading and writing. 
Are there any modifications as you've thought about this over and over again, as the report has been concluded? Are there any modifications that you would see um, necessary if this passes, which you know we certainly anticipate it will, um, with regard to literacy that could enhance it um, in terms of the report? And how do you view the possibility of full implementation of this as it relates to each of the districts in the state of Maryland? And of course, there are 24. So I, I'm just interested in your um, thought process about, okay, the next steps, if this is approved, how will it influence? Will it be a galvanizing force in the state of Maryland to put literacy on the map, to put um, early childhood education in, in such an important position to ensure the right beginning for children. Uh, are you muted? And uh, that's the most commonly spoken sentence a question. I'm sorry, say it again, Dr. Kerwin, because I, I think you most, were muted. Yeah, I know. That's the most commonly asked question. Oh, are you US muted? Today. Are right. you muted? Uh, and I was. I apologize. Thank you for the, uh, uh, for the question. Um, and of course, the blueprint bill is the encapsulation of the recommendations of the commission I chaired, the Commission on Innovation and Excellence. And uh, if, with your permission, since we have a number of people from out of state, I'd like to just say a brute sure, please three, do three words about what the commission did, and, and in particular what it did with, with regard to literacy. Um, so, um, it, 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 as part of our initial work uh, on the commission, we did a deep dive on just how well are Maryland schools serving uh, the state's children, and we uncovered a lot of a very alarming things. Um, among them uh, is something that Dean Orr mentioned a few moments ago that fewer than uh, uh, roughly a third, say, of our fourth and eighth graders um, uh, meet the standard of, met the standard of proficiency in the latest round of the NAEP uh, exam. We were also alarmed to learn that in terms of school funding, Maryland is actually a regressive state meaning we uh, invest significantly less funds in schools serving high concentrations of uh, low income and minority uh, communities than we should. This undoubtedly uh, impacts literacy levels uh, in these schools. We also became aware that as a nation, we don't fare well in uh, international comparisons uh, with regard to literacy against other uh, uh, industrialized economies. Um, uh, this, uh, was, this was a very relevant fact because as a central part of our charge, we were asked to make recommendations so that Maryland schools perform as well as the best performing school systems uh, in the world. And uh, what we learned in, is that in these high performing systems, they put an enormous focus on reading and literacy in the early years uh, as a result of comprehensive and excellent preschool programs. They have a high percentage of children, much higher than in Maryland, and I suspect other states, much higher percentage of children begin school ready to learn. These systems also identify struggling readers early on and work with them in small groups uh, with reading specialists. And unlike what we learned from Emily Hanford uh, earlier this morning, uh, un unlike what happens in the US, these high performing uh, systems bring, uh, are constantly bringing the latest research to bear in their teaching and learning practices um, in, in reading and other curriculum areas. So as, as part of our work, uh, we also invited literacy experts to make presentations to the commission. So based on all of this, we made a number of recommendations that we believe, if properly implemented, can make Maryland a national leader uh, in, in, in literacy. So let me just summarize a few, but by my, no means all of those recommendations. First, the commission recommended that Maryland provide high quality, full day preschool for all four-year-olds, free for low-income students, and free 
high quality, full day preschool for all low income three-year-olds. We, we believe this will greatly increase the proportion of students who begin kindergarten ready to learn. The commission also recommended that we turn Maryland from being a regressive to a progressive state in terms of school funding. One way this would be done is to designate all schools serving 55% or more low income students as community schools, which means they would get additional funding and staff, including reading specialists and funds for after school and summer tutoring and academic programs. The commission set the goal, admittedly aspirational, that all children be read, reading proficient by the third grade. Uh, to move towards this goal, the commission recommended a significant investment in reading resources, including funding for reading coordinators, teacher training, small group instruction, and lots of tutors. These resources would be focused, not exclusively, but focused on grades K through three. We also recommended a new certification requirement for mastery of reading instruction in all grades, K through 12. This is modeled on something similar in, uh, in Massachusetts. Obviously our teacher prep programs will need to respond to the, uh, these uh, new requirements uh, as well as uh, many other recommendations in the bill. Now the commission's recommendations, which are comprehensive and far reaching require a 10 year implementation timeline and a roughly $4 billion increase in funding by the 10th year. In the 2020 legislative session, all of this got rolled into what we call a blueprint for Mar Maryland's future bill. And the bill passed overwhelmingly by the General Assembly with strong bipartisan support. It was the happiest, one of the happiest days of my life. I bet. <laughs> the General Assembly and see this strong support for this bill. Unfortunately, because of COVID, the General Assembly had to adjourn right after they passed the bill. And also, unfortunately, the governor vetoed the bill uh, after the General Assembly left, claiming the state couldn't afford these reforms. Uh, there is no question that the General Assembly would have overridden the veto if they had still been in session. Now, the General Assembly is coming back uh, this month, in fact, and there is every expectation that the general uh, that uh, it will override the veto during this se session. In fact, I sense there is a wide agreement that the devastating impact of COVID has only accentuated the already clear need for these reforms and the importance of the blueprint bill. Uh, as a res the re result, the bill I think almost certainly will be enhanced with additional investments uh, this session, uh, investments that will certainly include invest uh, targeted uh, on, on reading and literacy. So Nancy, I believe the, the blueprint bill uh, will be passed and I believe it will provide the context and the resources that will enable Maryland uh, to make significant advances in addressing the literacy challenges uh, we have in our state. I can you just say a statement or two about the accountability for yeah. it? Because as taxpayers Absolutely. ask that question. This was a huge issue for the uh, commission. How do we ensure accountability? Uh, someone mentioned uh, a little bit ago, this tension between central control and local control, et cetera, et cetera. So what the commission uh, has recommended is that a blue ribbon, highly respected, group of citizens be appointed as an oversight uh, board um, uh, for the life of the implementation of the bill to ensure uh, and hold everybody accountable for the faithful implementation of these recommendations. This would be created by, this panel would be created by the governor and the General Assembly. They'd be responsible to the governor and the General Assembly. They would, they would um, be, uh, the, the watchdog, so to speak, and uh, also have some control on the release of resources to ensure that uh, all of these recommendations uh, get uh, 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 introduced um, uh, as intended and that we are seeing the results that we all wanna see. Thank you very much. It's a very exciting time in Maryland. It will be interesting to see what happens. Right. Um, 
I think there's some questions from the audience and, and given that we um, have a time left here, um, there is a question that um, I don't know if you want, uh, Dr. Bolger, you want me to read it or you want to read it, but it's for Drs. Burke and Santalesis. How do you select high quality materials? And then the question for Dr. Kerwin is, how can we ensure that school districts spend their funds on these high quality evidence-based materials and practices? So let's begin with the one for Dr. Burke and Santalesis. How do you select high quality materials? Dr. Burke, would you like to um, respond to that? Sure. Um, high quality materials, you're looking at, first of all, for elementary education, you're really looking at the alignment to the science of reading and you're looking for an alignment to your, to your state standards. You're also looking at the scope and sequence of it, uh, of how um, skills are introduced, um, what supplemental resources they have. Uh, and um, as we mentioned, the uh, opportunity for students to be able to explore more authentic texts, uh, not just narratives, not just our stories, but also be exposed to uh, the science and the social studies and other topics to broaden content knowledge. Uh, we do focus a lot on, on skills. We talk about the science of reading. We talk about learning to read. You know, but what are you reading to ensure that you have opportunities to, uh, to really practice those skills and, and apply what you've learned? So uh, just adopting those materials that don't have holes in them. And that is a part of, of empowering teachers with knowledge. Once you empower teachers with the knowledge of the science of reading, they're able to look at the curricula that have been adopted by their districts to say, oh, this has holes in it. Uh, this is weak in phonics, or, or this is, uh, you know, this doesn't have the, the text that we need in order to introduce these concepts or, or skills. And, and they're able to do that and feel confident about that. Whereas without the knowledge, any materials that are, that are being adopted, the teachers are just, you know, stuck with, well, I'm gonna use this because this is what my district is giving me. So I think that um, adopting those high quality instruction materials are, that's key, uh, but also take a look at what's in the shrink wrap. <laughs> when the yeah. parents come to you and say, you know, hey, this is great, this is stamped, it is aligned, we've looked at it. As a district, as a team, take a look at what's in those materials, have your checklist. Uh, the Rail Southeast does have a, I believe a practice guide that has uh, evaluating high quality instruction materials. And there's a checklist that district mm -hmm. see if it aligns to the science of reading and those things. So uh, use those types of resources to make those decisions. Thank you. And Dr. Santolisis, I, I liked your statement about pulling off the Band-Aid and really accepting the idea of vulnerability, but how does this weave into the selection of materials and the insurance that these materials are aligned. Sure, no, and I, I think a lot of, I mean, I, I agree, you know, with everything Dr. Burke said in terms of um, as teachers become more knowledgeable, um, they themselves can give that feedback. And, and also, I will say this, we, we try to involve teachers and parents and families in becoming familiar with the options, right? So it wasn't just, it wasn't just a, um, a central focus. It actually was something that, that we at least tried to engage the community in. I do think when we talk about um, adoption, I think part of ripping the Band-Aid off is not, you know, is knowing what the quality elements are. And again, Dr. Burke um, listed a lot of those. We, at the time, um, engaged with Ed Reports for part of that work um, in looking. So an outside organization can help you benchmark those materials, which also I think brings um, some level of um, comfort to folks that they know it's not all on them and their knowledge, which also helps. And then also having real conversations about where you might want to go further than the curriculum goes. So we knew that, for example, um, and I would say Wit and Wisdom and EL do a fabulous job in incorporating diverse text and real text. Um, but we also knew for Baltimore City, 
we wanted to pay attention to some of the cultural representation um, given our population. And so we weren't afraid to say to teachers, this needs to also carry out, for example, in our social studies um, curriculum as well. So being able to have real conversations, because I, I actually don't think there's a perfect set of curriculum materials. I think you're going to have holes someplace. You just don't want it to be major holes or holes in the major components. But when people have knowledge, they're better able to have um, conversations. And so we just made a decision to work with our social studies to build more of what we had wanted to see. Um, and, and I would say Wit and Wisdom is far more diverse than many of the other materials we, we saw. And one of the things we talked about previously was this idea of sustainability and continuity. And just a brief comment from both Dr. Burke and you about that issue in terms of materials. No, you're, People you're... have to be oriented to materials. They have to feel comfort in using them. How do they, how do they, how do you ensure that level of continuity uh, and sustainability? I would just say quickly, one of our most successful um, moves in this area has been the identification of teacher leaders at the classroom level. Teachers are going to listen to teachers. Principals are going to listen to principals. Yes, I, you know, I hope they are listening to me as well. But what we have found is that, that the staying power in most of the work, and this was true for me as CAO, the work, the work that was still there when I returned was work that people at the school level owned. And so Kier Butts, who is um, one of Baltimore City's Teachers of the Year, um, frankly, is being tapped nationally because of his ability to take his everyday classroom experience and communicate to peers. And when we um, really put folks who are getting the results, or what I like to say, receipts with kids, with these materials, it, it has a different staying power than even when I think this is a CEO. And, that, and that's where we're seeing where, where that teacher leadership matches sustainability. And Dr. Burke, would you like to make a comment about that? Sure. Um, I was recently in a district uh, that adopted Within Wisdom. So I will agree. Uh, <laughs> so you just said about that particular program. Uh, but I, I will say this, uh, get it right take some time, get the materials to get it right. There are so many districts that change materials after a couple of years, it doesn't work. Uh, but again, there are things that they didn't use. Uh, the fidelity was not there uh, to, to things were supposed to be taught. So accountability is going to be key. And um, take the time, get it right, invest the time, get it right the first time stick with it, understand that this is, this is what the district has chosen and hold everyone else accountable for doing it. In some cases, we actually had to uh, uh, have district personnel pull up to the school with trucks to say, give me all of your old materials. <laughs> <laughs> take you know, it out. Take it out of the building because if you don't, teachers will say, well, there's a good lesson here. Let me go mm -hmm. do this. So sometimes you do, you have to rip the bandaid off and you have to take, uh, take those other things away to say, this is what we do, we're doing. We know this is what's right for children and, uh, and we're gonna support you in that. So this question is for Mr. Weaver because you're in such a, a unique position in terms of being an organization that is so dedicated to literacy and equity. How are you working on this whole issue of professional development, because we all know that people are not coming to these classrooms, et cetera, with necessarily all of the requisite skills that are necessary to, to really achieve our goals. So is there, has the NAACP and, and the effort that you're heading focused on um, that area of professional development? Yeah, absolutely, we have. Uh, but before I jump into that, I just want to quickly step back to the curriculum selection piece. It's very critical. Yes. I want to make sure everyone hears this, um, that in addition to the technical aspects of picking something that checks all the boxes and does all the things that we know good, good curricula do, um, 
they have to also have two things. One, they have to have evidence of success with students from your, you know, that mirror the demographics of your student population. They have to have evidence of success. And so many of these programs just don't have it. And they're hoping that we don't look. The states don't look, the districts don't look, the parents don't look, uh, but you just go look, you read the studies, you look and see if there's actual evidence of success and not just anecdotal evidence, but actual you know, randomly controlled trials or as close as you can get to them. The second thing is usability in terms of planning time. So many districts around the country accept or uh, adopt curricula that require a lift for planning that's so onerous on teachers that it, it creates contentiousness, it burns people out, um, and they begin to make decisions. They, they, they put off aspects that are actually important um, for kids to, to be experiencing on a daily basis, but because it's not um, synthesized and distilled down to its most usable format, it, it, it creates a whole world of problems. I'm happy to talk more about that later, but uh, let me get to the PD piece. So yes, we've done both. We've offered direct PD, you know, sort of open professional developments for different networks, the charter networks around town, and also the district when invited. Um, but the other thing we've done is we have facilitated, paid for um, schools, grade level teams, and even individual teachers who've asked to go to training on assignment reading, just flat out. Um, CORE has a great, um, uh, great asynchronous class that people can take. They do it together at the school site, but you know people can log in at different moments and whenever their schedule is conveniently um, fine to that. And it, it's been received wonderfully. And it's also kind of led from behind. You know, if we as an outside provider uh, uh, um, organization are providing supports, um, like that, then school districts and systems tend to want to, to do that. And I'd say that's one of the big things that we can do both locally and at the state level. I've talked with a couple of legislators recently in California. Hey, listen, that's something you guys should be put on the docket. You know, we'll pay for, um, you know, Orton Gillingham training for our teachers. That would be transformational for student outcomes. We'll pay for letters training or core training or these things where teachers have access and administrators, they need to learn this too. They have access to the things that they didn't get in graduate school, frankly, oftentimes. Um, and the state can help with that. The other thing that we're working on is um, with another partner, actually a parent organization, we're working together to build a class, a professional development class for parents. So parents can understand the science of reading. So parents can, and, you know, it's geared towards them and their needs, et cetera, but so they can actually understand what their children need and so they can be um, illiterate as well. So absolutely, we've engaged in professional development and we're working with our district and system partners to make that a priority because no matter what uh, curriculum you adopt, you have to also provide professional development in the actual science of reading and not just how to implement a curriculum. Right, correct. Dr. Kerwin, do you have a comment you'd like to make on this subject? Well, uh, I do notice uh, one question in the chat uh, room that uh, was whether the pre-K through 12 oh. effort is integrated into the K through 12, the recommendation for K. Right. And I want to assure everyone they are. I mean, one of, was... our, one of our major recommendations is that we create a merit-based career mm -hmm. ladder for teachers and um, uh, where they would be uh, paid, uh, be benchmarked against other professions requiring uh, similar levels of education. This would include the pre-K through uh, teachers. So they're fully integrated into this, uh, in, into the system. Great. Um, I, I do know that um, it was one of the first really, really very strong uh, recommendations. Right. So I, I do feel a level of confidence about the early, um, a huge level of confidence about the early childhood piece. And we do have something, and I'm not gonna take time to talk about it, but each of the panels is probably aware of this. We have something called the Judy Centers, which now number like 53, 54 in the state of Maryland, which are incredibly unique and have outstanding results. So early childhood is a key part. Right, and Nancy, uh, the commission recommended a tripling of the number of Judy Centers. So they would be, there would be Judy centers in every uh, school district serving 
high concentrations of low income students. And some of those are public private partnerships. Yes, they are. In Baltimore City, there are several that are public private partnerships. And that is a really wonderful way of expanding. And that's back to this idea of you often need philanthropy. And I think Dr. Santelisis, you spoke to the Gates Foundation and how critical that contribution was. So I just wanna thank our panelists. They've been outstanding and are outstanding. And finally to thank Drs. Bolger and uh, Dr. Rice, uh, Jennifer Rice um, for launching this wonderful conference and placing in a very specific way, the emphasis on literacy and equity. And um, I think it is a national issue. And thank you for all you're doing individually and collectively to address this. Thank you. Dr. Bolger, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much. And thank you to our panel. And, and there's a ton of questions that, that many people have posed to us. And, and so this is a continuing conversation. And um, we are going to uh, transition to a moment into, uh, to, uh, like I said, breakout rooms where it's precisely these questions that we're, we want to translate this into policy, right? So that's the, the goal of, of this, this event we can't answer all the questions here, right? The, 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 this event was to plant the seeds to get the, the, get the ball rolling. And, and to get the ball rolling, not one, one school's gonna do this or one school's doing, gonna do this. This is, right, this is a statewide approach. We want and we need an all hands on deck. Uh, and, and many comments to, uh, you know, to Kareem's point of, of what is it from the grassroots, from the ground up, uh, verse, and then, uh, but from Dr. Burke and Dr. Santelisis and and uh, and also the the uh, Dr. Kerwin's commission about you know how do we handle this and how do we do this from a, uh, a you know both top down and bottom up and and so we have to really think about this as a massive approach to solving this for Maryland and 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 I think the important point is keeping it sustainable right and, and we that's the the big dirty word in implementation science lately has been right, is, is sustainability, right? I mean, everybody's got their one off small effect size or big effect size here and then you scale up and then it's gone, right? And we know, uh, thanks to, you know, the work of, of Dr. Burke and Dr. Uh, Butler and, and Mississippi that when you have a full hands-on approach, you see what, that's a model of what sustainable effort and, uh, you know, a model program and, and one thing, um, we didn't get to talk about it too much, but this tentacle of coaching, you know, this, this, this model that, that uh, where it's a statewide model of, you know, of, uh, you know, run through, you know, one system of, of coaching that goes, you know, from the state system down to the local districts and local schools where everyone's on the same page, but it's not just one way. It's not just top down in which we're telling you how to do things. It's bottom up in which what worked here, right? We, you know, we, College of Education had a implementation science um, conference that, a year or two ago, where we talked about the fact that how did you adapt? Because it's in the adaptations, it's in the contextualization, it's in what works for Baltimore. You know, they contextualized, you know, certain things for their, you know, but it's based on the science, right? So what we've talked about a lot in the morning is the content of the science, right? And and oftentimes it's not fidelity in and of itself to a particular program, but it's what, how you contextualize it to your students. And that feeds to say that was successful. So feed that information up the ladder. So that others can learn, and so without a without a sustainable network, without a network at all, right? We're all just swimming alone, or, and and oftentimes we're drowning alone, barely keeping above water. Um, and so I'm hoping you know, uh, uh, Dr. Burke and, and others can talk about the, those models in these um, these sessions, these breakout sessions, where we're going to plant the seeds for policy for how do we move forward? How do we make this real? How do we make the things that we've talked about in this conference, uh, in this summit, and this is just the start of having these fearless conversations. And so in order to, to uh, kick this off and, and um, to really get us going, especially from a policy angle, I, I asked Dr. Pinsky, uh, sorry, Senator Pinsky, uh, right. to, um, to say a, a few words and to uh, talk about the role that that the state and the legislature can play in this and to really get us kind of going on this on this ball. So uh, welcome, Senator Pinsky, and I thank you so much for being a part of this. Uh, uh, thank, 
Thank you, Dr. Bolger and, uh, and Dean Rice for inviting me. Thank you very much. Uh, you, you've heard from uh, Britt Kerwin, who headed the commission, the three-year commission that resulted in the uh, Maryland blueprint for Maryland's future. And, you know, it's a 10-year phase in what we thought would be a systematic approach. And, and from the very beginning, we wanted to make sure that we used an equity lens in developing um, the proposals. And that's from teacher preparation to entering the profession, to attracting the best and brightest, to paying them appropriately, to uh, community schools and wraparound services, to tutoring in early grades. So, you know, the equity lens, I think, is seen through all of the uh, multiple recommendations we make. And, and if I can borrow a phrase that I first heard from uh, uh, Superintendent Jerry Weist, he said, uh, you need to raise the bar and close the gap. So in other words, we want to challenge students, expect more to be a world class. At the same time, we understand there's a gap and we have to close that gap. So we want to do both at the same time, uh, raise the bar and close the gap. That being said, you know, we finished our work a, over a year ago and last year we passed the actual legislation. Um, and that's a 10 year phase in program and that was pre COVID. And then we're hit with um, the pandemic. And as hard as teachers and parents and students have worked and applied themselves, uh, many students have simply gotten crushed. I mean, remote learning is very difficult. I was in the classroom. Uh, I sort of am, am happy I'm not teaching at the moment because uh, it really is a challenge. And um, it's hard. It, people were not prepared for it. With that, um, whether we're talking about middle-class white students uh, in the western part of Montgomery County in the Potomac area, uh, I believe many of them will lose at least three months, maybe six months. And, and, and impoverished students, uh, black and brown students, I believe will lose a year of uh, learning loss and maybe as much as a year and a half. So that adds a new layer to our effort to be, make our, our state and our schools and students world class. So that brings to going from 30,000 feet to 500 feet or, or 300 feet. Um, what do we do now? We're going into our legislative session in Maryland in uh, a week or, or five or six days. Uh, and I believe we have a, an immediate crisis we have to address. So unfortunately the 10 year phase in because of it being vetoed by the governor uh, has put it off another year. And then we have to make up all of this difference with COVID. So I'm going to propose um, among the various solutions besides the broadband and having access in the rural area and, um, and Wi-Fi cold spots in urban areas, Baltimore, my own county of Prince George's, uh, I think we're gonna need massive tutoring. Um, I think we need it and need it now over the next 12 or 15 months. There are clearly many models, one-on-one, one-on-three. -on -one, one -on there are a number of, of tutoring that have past the threshold where they have shown results. Uh, I believe we're going to need uh, to expand summer school. For July, I think we need to work and pay and put in place a significant investment. And actually next week or the week after, I'm meeting with four local superintendents in our state, including Dr. Santelises, who has been uh, terrific in our state and in assisting me to ask him what other recommendations and solutions they would suggest to, to, to close this gap. Many students are two and three years behind. There are some who are only a year behind. Um, and, and the discussion also has to include what assessment we use to figure out which students to target. Um, so there are a lot of questions involved with making these more immediate challenges. And for those of you who are history buffs, after World War II, uh, to rebuild Europe, there was something called the Marshall Plan, which was a very quick, large, immediate uh, investment in Europe to rebuild it as quickly as possible. And in some ways, I see the challenge facing us now as our own educational Marshall Plan. Um, the sooner we can get students on grade level or near grade level, uh, the less this year will be seen with an asterisk. You know, in, in the Kerwin proposal, we said there'd be tutoring. We, we distribute money for the, for the first five years of the 10-year program 
to assist students so they're on grade level in reading and math by third grade. Because I think we all know once you fall behind, you fall behind, children get alienated, they act out, and unfortunately it could be, in some cases be the beginning of the school to prison pipeline. So we understood the first three grades or, or K through three uh, to do the uh, tutoring, but clearly what's happened with, a, with the pandemic means the tutoring has to go K through 12. So that's one of the issues I believe our legislature will be taking up to try to um, minimize the damage that's been done to our students, particularly um, those in poverty in black and brown uh, across the state. So look, I'm glad uh, all of you are taking this issue up. It's very, very crucial. Um, we are a very diverse state. We have some schools and school systems that are doing well and others facing major challenges. Uh, we have great super local superintendents, and we're trying to give them the resources and assistance to make them successful. So again, thank you for inviting me. I know you want to get into breakout. So uh, Dr. Boulder, I'll pass it back to you. Great. And thank you so much. And, and again, your commitment uh, right to this is, is just, it's so important. And it's so important for, for the state to see that, that uh, state leaders from top to bottom are taking this as the number one priority, and, and and as we heard, you know these different models of uh, of uh, implementing uh, instruction and and how often and, and clearly we know uh, that intervention and, and getting in and intervening early and, and often is is going to be what what uh, you know keeps that learning loss or you know prevents that that loss from happening even before COVID. Uh, and, you know, especially in, in light of COVID, you know, we know that, you know, it's, it's going to be, you know, some level of sustained effort uh, that's going to be needed in order to, to round that corner. And, and, and thank you so much for all of your, your uh, comments and, and, and support. Thank you so much. This is, uh, there have been great conversations and, and uh, lots of productive conversations. And so thank you everybody for coming and we look forward to, uh, you know, sending out the next steps and, and going from here. Um, but I'll turn it over to Dean Rice. That sounds great. So I just want to echo DJ in thanking you all for your engagement in the breakout sessions. That's a really important part of what we're doing here today. It's going to help us move forward. Um, and now as we you know are in this final session and draw our summit to a close, I want to make just a few comments about our work here today and, and, and what we expect will come next. So let me just start by saying um, the College of Education here at the University of Maryland has just a deep commitment. It's, it is a deep, deeply seated in our mission to expand access to high quality educational opportunities that empower individuals to reach their own goals and to contribute to our broader social goals in terms of civic, democratic, uh, and economic institutions in society. And we do this through a range of different things, through our, our cutting edge research. We've heard a lot about research today through our responsive and innovative instructional programs, including educator preparation, and through our meaningful partnerships with school systems, the state, nonprofits, and other organizations that share our commitments to excellence, impact, equity, and inclusion. We know that we can't do it alone. We need each other. And so we see it as our role and responsibility to help facilitate these kinds of important fearless conversations that bring together stakeholders with the range of perspectives needed frankly, to solve these kinds of complex problems in education, like inequity in reading and literacy that we've been talking about today. One theme that, that I picked up throughout the day has been a recognition of the many factors that we need to examine and address as we move forward with this issue. I think almost every speaker, if not every speaker today, recognize this complexity. We're talking about curriculum, teacher preparation and coaching, academic support, funding, leadership, and accountability, just to name a few. Emily Solari, I uh, used the image, uh, an image that I, I liked a lot, it conjured up an image in my own head, um, of the multiple levers that need to be pulled simultaneously. I think that was, this is, that was close to her own words. But since we each just have two hands, that job of pulling all of these levers at the same time is really going to require that we all work together. In the words of DJ earlier, it is all hands on deck, top down and bottom up. And we need to be ready to roll up our sleeves and continue to engage in this work together. And this begins with what it is we've been doing today with arriving at a shared understanding of some of the problems and root causes 
and a shared commitment to developing effective and sustainable evidence-based solutions to ensure opportunity and, and achievement for all of our children. And I mean all of our children, especially those brilliant young people, in the words of Kareem Weaver earlier, who have been left behind, who have stared across that gap, who want and who deserve to realize their potential. So the work that we have started today needs to continue. It can't stop here. From these working groups formed this afternoon, we plan to create networks of stakeholders to coalesce around the specific goals and ideas and plans uh, that have been advanced, that have surfaced. And, and we really hope, we, we look to put behind us the days of going it alone, wondering what might work without having the knowledge and evidence and answers. Rather, we look forward to building a future in which we have systematic statewide approaches to holding each other up, to lifting all boats, to raising all communities through the power of education. As you've heard today in several comments that it's clear that monetary resources are gonna be an important component of this, but the real critical factor, especially at this point in the process is the knowledge and the transmission and communication of that knowledge grounded in research and translated into practice. That's why it's critical for us, the University of Maryland College of Education, along with our partners across the state to do our part, to take up the mantle of leadership to guide us forward. And it's critical that we open our doors, at least our virtual doors to all of you, um, the teachers and principals on the ground, the local school administrators and state leadership, the nonprofit organizations and advocates, and the many parents who are hoping for a brighter future for their children. It's critical that all of you continue to be part of this conversation to build these bridges. So on behalf of my co-sponsors in the School of Public Policy, um, great partners in so many different areas. Um, I absolutely love working with Bob Orr and his team. Um, with MSDE and the NAACP of Maryland, I would like to thank you all for your participation in this important event. And a special thank you to our speakers and panelists who have joined us from all sides of the country and all corners and crevices of our state. Um, I also want to thank the organizers of the, the event. Just a heartfelt thank you again to Jennifer and DJ, who have been working, as I said, you know, for a year now with all of these stakeholders and experts, uh, as well as our planning committee. And DJ, did you have a slide that you could put up to, uh, to show all of the people who have been really in the trenches um, helping to move uh, this work forward? Um, these individuals, and you can see their names here, um, represent a range of different organizations um, our partner organizations, uh, but, but others as well, um, who have been uh, key partners in making sure that all of the perspectives that need to be represented uh, are in fact uh, represented in the conversations that we have had today. So these individuals, as well as their colleagues and our colleagues at the University of Maryland who helped plan the summit. So thank you um, to this very special group of individuals as well. And just in closing, you know, when we initially began discussing and planning this summit in some early conversations uh, that DJ and I had more than a year ago, we envisioned a very different experience than what we've had today. Probably in our stamp student union with breakout rooms and a lovely lunch and real tables and chairs and small talk and informal conversations. And we weren't able to do that. But despite the circumstances of the pandemic, I am just absolutely delighted that we've been able to facilitate an engaging set of interactions with almost 250 passionate participants. And I look forward to continuing this work together as we move forward. And when the pandemic subsides and we can, when we can all return to our physical workspaces and, and that day will come, I welcome you to please come to our University of Maryland campus and and visit, pay a special visit to that Frederick Douglass statue that I talked about this morning. And remember his wise words, once you learn to read, you will be forever free. Literacy that results from effective, equitable and evidence-based instruction for all students is a foundation for success in school and ultimately success and full opportunity in life. So thank you for joining us in this work together. And I look forward to working with you all as we move forward.